Welcome to the Sports Scouting Report Podcast with Lee Brickeen. Uh, you're listening to Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Burkeen. Our guest today is our editor, uh, Jace Lejeune. Uh, Jace is with us, and we're going to talk about the high school playoffs. We're going to talk about – we made our picks about a month ago, and I, yeah. I think some of them are wrong on my end and obviously some probably on yours. But, we, you know, it's all in fun. But, Jace, thanks for joining us this morning, and we're going to talk about not just the playoffs, but – um, who we thought would win and who's surprised to get there on the private side. We've already punched tickets to the state championship games. The public side, there's one more game to go. And then we're going to talk about college football, LSU, the F- LSU-Florida game. We're going to talk about coaching changes in college football. Signing day is Wednesday, the first signing day, which I think it's probably going to be the least amount of players signed in the country ever because of COVID-19. Uh, the, the next thing we're going to talk about is the Saints which was a horrible game to watch yesterday. But we'll go ahead and get started, Jason. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, Lee. How was your weekend? It was good, except the Saints just looked. Hey, right. Like, it looked like they all went out, you know, on a cruise ship for 10 days and just forgot to play football, I think. They're just a different team. We'll talk about that. and then. But LSU was the opposite. LSU, yeah. LSU beat Florida. And the Saints let Philadelphia Eagles beat them sort of like the way LSU beat Florida. It was just, you know, they changed seats. and then Yeah, it was the opposite of what everybody thought going in. <laughs> so, yeah, and, uh, you know, it always happens that way in the NFL. Every time a team's horrible and, all oh, they're going to win, they're going to beat this team, the bad team always finds a way to, to, to get up the nerve to say, I'm tired of people saying we can't win. And then you just you get flat, too. It wasn't a great – Coaching called game by Peyton, and he's a genius. But, you know, all, mm-hmm. all geniuses have bad days calling plays. It just wasn't a good day for him. But we'll get we'll talk about the Saints later in the show. I want sure. To, um, I had a good weekend because I'm just glad the high school football playoffs actually happened. Me and you were worried about it back in May, in June. Oh, yeah. In, 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 in April, actually, when we were actually still – working in the office before this stuff came around COVID-19 and it's just I'm just so glad that we were able to and then there was worry that we wouldn't play the playoffs once we got to the playoffs but I think I think it's really doing great considering and and I'm a big advocate that we have sports because kids I don't think it's healthy to be locked in for nine months not doing anything you know and I think it's healthy uh, Jace, the yeah. kids getting out, being able to compete, get their mind off of everything. You know what I mean? Yeah, I totally agree with you. And, uh, I mean, it just, uh, you got to applaud the OHSA and, uh, you know, what these teams are doing because during COVID and everything going on, there are a lot of expectations that there could be some forfeits. And I think so far there's been only a few, nothing really too noticeable. Uh, so, I mean, all these teams are doing a really good job of, uh, passing their COVID protocols and doing whatever they need to do to complete the season. And when you play the football games, you just forget about it. You know, when you go out there in a uniform, you just forget about the world's problems. And I think that's healthy for young kids and coaches and, and actually people that go to the games, parents or just alumni, just something to be excited about during bad, tough times. But we're going to go ahead and get started. Jace, I want to do the private side of it first. Sure. Division one. And we'll talk about, you know, me and you made predictions about a month ago. might have been even five weeks ago, but it was before the playoffs mm-hmm. started. I predicted Catholic and Bird, and that's the only one I got right. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, nobody picked Bird, I don't think, in South Louisiana. I think a lot of North Louisiana people were riding Bird, but, you know, this will be Bird's first appearance since 2015. Before 2015, it had been, you know, 40 years. Yeah, it's been quite a drought before that. Yep. And you got your alma mater, Catholic High, which I didn't go Correct. to. I'm, I'm a Central High School grad in Baton Rouge, and then Bird High School in Shreveport. I, I'm. I think I picked Catholic to win it. You know, a month ago, actually six months ago, you heard me telling you that I thought your school would probably yeah. win it this year. But Bird's going to give them everything they have, and I think it's going to be a great game. And and it's you know what. If you're a Bird fan, listen, this this could go either way. 
Mm-hmm. We're just picking games, and this is an even game to me. It really is an even game. Catholics got a lot of injuries right now from that brother Mark game. They do. They do. And I don't know if Catholics going to be the same on offense if they can't get Corey Singleton back and and a couple of other guys get back. They've got three or four starters on their offense. I don't even know if they're going to play in this game, Jace. Yeah, and then they got Landon O'Connor just back from uh, yeah. Yeah. and he got hurt again. Uh, but you got really uh, the freshman for Catholic Daniel Beal. He's doing himself. He's having an excellent. Uh, excellent start. Uh, and then, you know, uh, everybody was offering uh, their sophomore, so uh, Samson. Yeah, sure. And he's st- showing Samson, and he's starting to get off, and he had himself a really good brother morning game. So, uh, but, yeah, for Bird, uh, if they can see what, what brother Morton was doing against, because there was a time brother Morton, uh, I think three straight possessions, they went right down the field and scored. So if, they're, if they can control the ball, control the clock, what they did against John Curtis. And, I mean, that'll play into their favor. It's just about what playing style is going to advance. And going back at it, Lee, I was half right. <laughs> so I got my alma mater in. Uh, on the other side, I actually picked St. Augustine to win. Yeah. Uh, but they fell to, to, to Bird, and Bird probably had the better team, uh, more senior-laden team. Uh, I just picked St. Aug based on the upside and the talent that they have. Well, you know, St. Aug, John Curtis – and Brother Martin, all of these teams are pretty equal. You know, it could have been any of them. I mean, it. you know, we just – I just picked because I think Bird was just more determined because they haven't been in forever. I think yeah. St. Aug was the same way. St. Aug will have their day one day soon because they're going to be young again next year. But Catholic, Catholic has a chance to go on a run here with a young team. And, and like you said, their young quarterback, Bill, who's only a freshman – He's at least 6'1", 6'2", right now in height, and he throws the long ball really good for a 14-year-old kid. And, you know, I know Shelton Sampson's 6'4", going up catching these balls, but he's very poised. He doesn't look like nothing bothers him. Uh, for he does not. He's, he's probably the – he is the best 14-year-old Catholic quarterback I've ever seen play. I don't think Dale Weiner started a 14-year-old freshman quarterback. No, I mean, it was really rare that – any freshman or star, you can go back. We've been talking about Dale Warner. The only one they really started as a freshman was Claude Edwards Hilaire. And that was really the only one he started. So having a freshman quarterback step up the way he did, that's pretty impressive. And I remember Daniel he was as a little ball boy uh, for Catholics so when I was back in high school. So it's crazy to see now that he's, you know, <laughs> he's growing to maybe one of the best prospects in the state in a couple of years, knowing that he's only a freshman. Yeah, the thing about Catholic, too, they've got some injuries on defense and offense. And so I noticed on the sideline they had about five guys already sitting out the Brother Martin game, so they had another five get hurt in this game. they got to get ten guys back. And I really believe yes, if they don't get these ten guys back, then Bird, I don't know what shape they're in. I, I didn't go to their game. Um, I watched them this year, but I'm sure it was a pretty physical game with John Curtis. So it's probably even on injuries, I would I would guess. Um, but, but right. you know, the one thing Bird doesn't have on offense is a home run threat like Brother Martin had at wide receiver. They had a couple of home run threat receivers. Um, and, right. But Bird's defense is better than Brother Martin. So, yeah. Catholic's going to probably have to throw it more than they even did mm-hmm. against Brother Martin. I mean, there was four long balls yeah. to Shelton. Right. I mean, really, they right. ran the ball a lot if you take out those four bombs that – that build through and Shelton caught three touchdowns on one drive, two called back. So <laughs> he did, yeah. he dominated the game and it was pretty interesting coming in the game. He only had nine catches. So yeah. it was just only a matter of time for him to uh, evolve, especially when, with the quarterback change, cause you know, Lance more of a runner and having uh, Daniel there is more the, the pocket guy. Uh, really. I mean, it's been a fan for, for Shelton Sampson to get open and make some plays. And I was really surprised by the uh, the senior fullback for Catholic stepping up. That kid that's five eight, about two twenty. I mean, he, he is a load. He's incredible. And then, uh, you know, they got down to one senior running back, George Hart. George did a, did an right. incredible job. But I really think if they can get Corey Singleton back, Whit Hart, if somehow Corey can come back, or maybe yep. with Trey uh, to running back again, their young sophomore Trey Benson, who's really talented. Right. 
But they, yeah. you know, I don't know how many high schools have five running backs like Cap. Like, I don't think anybody. Yeah, they're probably the most deep at that position. And but the good news is, Lee, with the, them being a private school uh, for the state championship, they get a week off. So right. that week off will will definitely benefit not only Cap but Bird as well, hanging to that game in Natchitoches. Well, actually, a week and four days. Yep. Right. True. True. Because it's like a four or five day week. So you, the, got the a, game. you got almost two weeks off for Bird and Catholic. And Bird only has a about an hour drive, which, you know, you can look at every angle of this game, but I think it's going to be a close game. I think it'll be kind of similar to the way Bird won their game over Curtis and the way Catholic, you know, won their game over Brother Martin. Brother Martin was really in it until about the last five minutes. Yeah, they were. They were. And so it's going to be a similar game, I think. Uh, but we're going to go back, and, and again, I'm going to keep my winner. I mean, I, I picked Catholic. And who did you pick to win it all a month ago? I'm trying to remember for you. Uh, yeah, it was Catholic. Yeah, I just okay. picked the, the wrong other team to make the state championship. Yeah, I do believe Catholic will, will win. The Purple Knights appreciate that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they uh, disappointed me in the playoffs, but that's, that's I know they'll right. go next year. <laughs> we're going to take a break and be back with Jace Lejeune, our, our editor. We're talking high school playoffs. We're talking high school state championship games. And in, in the later part of the show, we're going to talk LSU, Florida game, the Saints, and college coaching changes. Also signing, the first signing day is Wednesday, which, again, I, don't, I think there's going to be the least amount of kids signed in the history of college football because of COVID, especially on the 1AA and D2, D3 levels, and even a lot of the small D1 schools. We're going to be back, and we're going to talk about Division Two for the state championship games when we come back. Listen, whatever you're driving right now, Tommy Harvey wants it. Bring it in to Harvey Subaru, Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City, or John Harvey Toyota. They're paying big bucks for all trades right now. They'll cut you a check right there. Tell them Lee sent you. Welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Burkeen. Our guest today is Jace Lejeune, who's our editor for our magazine and helps us with our website, LAFootballMagazine.com, which you can go to and still get our North Preview Magazine and South. You can still use this as a guide from the, you know for the playoffs, state championship games. Your kids might be in if you're a new listener. But we're going to talk, we're going to continue our topic is the high school playoffs, and we're talking state championship games. This segment, Division Two, and in layman terms, Division Two is the private side of really 4A, and no surprise here, you know, I did pick these two right. I, I, I did pick St. Thomas Moore to play De La Salle. Jace, how did you come out on your bracket for this one? Uh, same. Uh, a lot of people were expecting De La Salle and St. Thomas Moore, and that's what we got. And just like a couple of years ago when everybody was expecting De La Salle and you high. Uh, so it's kind of the same thing with this one. Uh, but, you know, everybody was saying that St. Thomas Moore hanging in was the runaway, runaway favorite. But now I'm starting to think that this game is going to be a lot closer than people realize. And uh, I'm sure you'll talk about it. But a lot of kudos have to go to you high for yeah. their performance against St. Thomas Moore and making really a close and competitive game. Yeah, I was going to say that, Jace. Uh, you high made the game against St. Thomas Moore very – made those St. Thomas Moore fans pretty nervous because they played as good as they could have played against one of the best offenses in the state. And St. Thomas Moore is going to have a challenge. I mean, look, I saw De La Salle play this year, and they played Amit. And Amit's very talented. Amit almost beat Manny. We'll talk about that. Sure. And Manny's, you know, my pick to win the state championship in the, in the lower classifications. But – De La Salle has got some talent, and they've got a lot of talent on defense. they got a huge offensive line, and all these guys are angry because they lost to St. Thomas Moore last year in the state championship game. Right. And it was a blowout last year, and it was played, remember, at St. Thomas Moore because of the way things were set up. Yeah, of course. Yep. But now it's a neutral site. It's not going to be a home game for a state championship team, which I don't think state championship teams should have a home game. But no. because of the consequences of not playing in a dome, you know, last year. But being in – that it's going to be in Turpin Stadium in Natchitoches, you know, I'm picking St. Thomas Moore to still win it. But yeah, this is going to be a good game. This is not going to be a blowout like the game a year ago 
at St. Thomas More, and I really believe that De La Salle's D-line is as good as any that St. Thomas More has seen outside of Karen Crow. Karen Crow was a good test to kind of see where mm-hmm. – St. Thomas Moore was, and because Karen Crow scored 81 points on your dad's team at Plaquemine. Yeah, I'm sure we'll talk about we'll that. Talk about that too. <laughs> but um, I just, I still go with St. Thomas Moore. I think Jack Besh is a gamer when it comes to big games. Yep. And I think Jack is going to be tough for them to stop. I, I hate to say one guy, but and then you look at the other receivers at St. Thomas Moore, and you look at Walker Howard's coming into his own. He is. But, again, De La Salle's got a defense. If there's one that can stop them, like Karen Crow would be would be them. And they're a little bit better than Karen Crow. I think Coach mm-hmm. uh, has done a great job. Coach Manali. Yeah, oh, man, he's done a great job coming over from Rommel, you know, where he was at Archbishop Rommel for many years. But this is going to be another classic. You know, this is what the LHSA wants. They want competitive games, and it's going to be on TV. I think – I don't know what the – what the LHSA decide if it's going to be taped or delayed. But anyway, it's going to be a great game. I, I'm going to still take St. Thomas more. And I think Jack Besh is going to show the state mm-hmm. why, why he's committed to LSU and why Vanderbilt wanted him so early and why I've been popping him for two years. He's, he's going to be really tough. I don't know if anybody can defend him. I, I really don't. I really don't think there's a corner in the state that can defend Jack one-on-one. And, uh, I mean, just – he was a difference maker last week. Uh, third down, St. Thomas Moore needed it. And they threw a short pass to Jack. And they needed about 10 yards to go. And he was able to step on a couple of guys and get that first down mark. So, it shows you how competitive he is. And his willingness to win, I think, really separates him from a lot of guys. And, and one thing to mention, De La Salle's offensive line is the key here. It is. They, now I was about they, to go into that too. They, yep. they outman St. Thomas Moore by about thirty pounds. St. Thomas Moore's yep. got a decent sized D line, but they're not huge. And then when you look at the De La Salle's O line, I mean, we're talking a two hundred and eighty pound O line that's very athletic with seniors. And they've got three seniors that are prospects, two young guys that are huge. The Holden kid at center. Yagorowski yep. is incredible. He's 6'3", about yep. 290. The, the, the other kid, that's the left tackle that we've had on our second team, all Louisiana team, that's 6'4", 330, John Martin. Yeah, John Martin. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, a man-child. So the task is, can St. Thomas Moore's D-line play for 60 minutes and not wear down with that big old line that's aggressive by De La Salle? De La Salle's got two incredible running backs. Yeah, they do. They really do. And their quarterback's very athletic. He's he's evolved. So it's two offenses. And they and mm-hmm. you know people might say can can De La Salle keep up? Well, you high did. They have they have the formula to win and pull off the upset. And uh, what you what the best way is to put an explosive offense off the field is to limit their possession. So and they can control the clock, run the football and, you know, make plays when they need to in the passing game, extend drives. They go like five, six-minute drives to the big offensive line, wear St. Thomas more down, keep Besh, keep Howard off the sidelines. That is their best chance of winning that game. But they have the recipe and they have the personnel to pull off that upset. And then remember the name Mortel Johnson, the running back at De La Salle, 6'2", 215. Yeah. He's, he's going to show everybody in the state what he's got. He's got a lot of talent. You know, everybody, I think a lot of people, the, the, the normal person, they start looking at prospects when they watch playoff games. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'll start, right. watching, they, these, I'll start watching these guys, you know, a year or two before this, and I'm like, and people go, well, Lee, did you see that guy? I'm like, yeah, I saw him two years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Back when, back when they, everybody, before everybody knows, you're, back you're, at freshman and sophomore. You're seeing him his last game of his career, you know, but – but yeah, yeah they they've got the run game. It's going to be interesting. It, and it might be one of those twenty-eight to twenty-eight games late in the fourth quarter where somebody get has the ball last, you know. But we're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Division Three, which is basically uh, same teams almost. And I was wrong here, completely wrong. I was wrong on on each team I picked to make it. I know Jace is a little different, possibly. We'll be right back. We'll have more on the Sports Scouting Report. I'm Lee Burkeen, your host. Our guest is Jace Lejeune, our editor. We'll be right back. 
Looking for a used car? Harvey Autos has three dealerships, which means three times the used vehicles. They've got everything from fuel-efficient compacts to luxury models, even hybrids, and certified pre-owned with a warranty. Check out John Harvey Toyota, Harvey Subaru, or Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City. Welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Burkeen. Our guest today is our editor of Louisiana Football Magazine, Jace Lejeune. Jace, we're talking Division Three in this segment, our topic. I was completely wrong. I was I was <laughs> I was just I just had this feeling that Newman would finally get there. And and I was picking Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. And I was wrong on, on each side. Now at the same time, I wasn't shocked because last year Christian right, has a great right. team, and St. Charles Catholic has a great team with Frank Monica. So I'm not shocked. Since, no, uh, since, I'm not shocked. Since my winner is not in the in the state championship, I got to pick a new winner now. Yeah, right. Because I was right. wrong on each team. So St. Charles Catholic, I'm going to go with them over Lafayette Christian only because I didn't think Lafayette Christian would beat Newman without Sage Ryan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but if Sage is not healthy for this game, this is a little different. I think St. Charles has a better defense than Newman, and I think St. Charles is pretty playoff ready. And I, I just, you know, I'm going for the underdog in this. I know Lafayette Christian is the favorite, and they got a great team, great program. But I'm gonna go with St. Charles just because they're due, and he's won state mm-hmm. championships. Frank Monica has got a great defense. And their offense came on and beat a great Notre Dame. Notre Dame was my pick yeah. to go with Newman. Right. But right. to me, the biggest win, Jason, in the semis was Notre Dame losing to St. Charles. What do you think of that? Yeah, and uh, and this is – I can't believe I'm saying that. I actually got both, both of them right. Uh, and I was kind of shocked. To be honest with you, I wasn't too confident in St. Charles Catholic being Notre Dame. And uh, obviously so. Uh, but – I mean, St. Charles Catholic rose to the task. And, I mean, Notre Dame had their chances in the end. They had a chance to, to tie the game with a two-point conversion, and St. Charles Catholic made the stop. So it was just your classic game between two of the best coaches around, and Frank Monica and Louis Cook, and just your classic throwback game there. And on the other side, you look at the Lafayette Christian and Newman. I was kind of shocked that they were able to slow down Arch as much as they did without Sage Ryan. Uh, but it really shows you the other – is not just Sage out there on defense. They got a lot of great pieces and a really good front seven as well. So, uh, I mean, just not shocked, I would say, that both these two teams are in there. But, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit surprising. And uh, this actually sets up a rematch from last year's state championship game, which you are talking about St. Thomas Moore beat De La Salle pretty bad last year in the state championship game. But Lafayette Christian beat St. Charles Catholic pretty bad last year as well. So I know St. Charles Catholic is very motivated for that game. And it'll be interesting to see what the status is for uh, stage run for Lafayette Christian. But uh, in, in the beginning, I had Lafayette Christian win it all and had this exact state championship game. So I had to stick with my pick. I had to stick with Lafayette <laughs> Christian. Yeah, you can't, you can't change your pick. Yeah. <laughs> right, um, right. And then you you went with me this year to the St. Charles game against Franklinton this year. Yes, sir. And St. Charles Catholic, you could tell, had a lot of talent. They just didn't put it together, and they, they've evolved. They're kind of like LSU we're going to talk about later in the show. This young freshman group has evolved with Max Johnson. But St. Charles has the best linebacker to me in the state. You've heard me say it over and over. They, they right. have – the next Deion Jones at linebacker that nobody's talking about. He's committed, I believe, with the Tulane right now. Right, Mandel Eugene. Yep. Mandel Eugene is a guy that can have 20 tackles in this game, and he could take over the game. He's a 6'2", 6'1", about 215, runs 4'5", and he reminds me of Deion Jones when Deion played at Jesuit in New Orleans before LSU, and, and Deion was about the same size. Actually, wasn't even as heavy. Deion was probably about 200 pounds. Mm-hmm. And believe it or not, people were not a big fan of Coach Chavis, but that's who signed Dion. And guess who gave him the film? I did. I gave him the film back. <laughs> but Coach Chavis, uh, 
signed Deion Jones and and made him into a, a heck of a linebacker. He grew into a linebacker at LSU at 220 pounds. Now he's 230, and he's with the what they call the Dirty Birds against the Saints two times a year. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take yeah. a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Division Four, which I got this one right. Um, I got these two guys right. Washita Christian's going to play Calvary Baptist. We'll talk about that. And later in the show, we're going to talk about the, there's one more game to go before we can decide who's going on the public side from 1A to 5A. We'll talk about that. And then LSU Florida, we're going to talk about the Saints. We're going to talk about coaching changes in college football and signing the first signing days this Wednesday, which is going to be very interesting. We'll be right back. So, hey, guys, just wanted to take a minute to tell you about Harvey Autos. If you need a new or used car, there's three great dealerships right here worth checking out. John Harvey Toyota, Harvey Subaru, and Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City. Low prices, honest people, tell them Lee sent you. Welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Burkeen. Our guest today is Jace Lejeune, who's our editor and also helps us with our website, LAFootballMagazine.com, helps us with the podcast. He's our producer for the podcast right now. He helps edit the shows and put the commercials in and helps us with the shows that we do. And when I, when I do a show, I'll send it to him. He helps me get it ready to get, get out there for everybody to listen to. And this segment, our topic is Division Four of the playoffs, which is the private side. And this is basically 1A, Class 1A. And, you know, Calvary Baptist beat a very good Southern Lab team, Jace, to get there, and I, I knew that would be a good game. Um, for me and Catholic, man, that was an overtime, two overtime games with Washita Christian. That was a great game. And it just seems like Washita Christian always wins these close games. I mean, they've, they've won them. <laughs> they do. And I picked Washita Christian to win it all. <laughs> Obviously, I'm going to stick with that. Calvary Baptist is capable of winning this game because of uh, Landry, Liddy, the quarterback. They've got a yeah, lot, of, talented quarterback. A lot yep. of good talent there. Wilson at receiver. They've got a young – they're the, probably one of the youngest teams in the state championship games is Calvary Baptist is super young. So you got to take your hat yeah. off to uh, the whole coaching staff at Calvary Baptist for getting this team. I mean, this is a junior, sophomore, freshman team. This is not a big senior group. And mm-hmm. On the other hand, Washita Christian has a senior group yeah. Led by Hunter Herring, who's 6'4", 215, and, and they have a lot of seniors. they got a big O line. The, the, big, the big story of this game to me, and I've seen both teams play this year, is the athletic ability of Calvary with the muscle of Washtenaw Christian. What I mean the muscle, the power. You know, Washtenaw yeah. Christian is a, a running team, basically. And they can throw it with Hunter when needed, but they're a power game team. I mean, they're going to run right at you, kill clock. They got a big O line, probably their best O line since they had Rudy Niswanger uh, back in the day, Brandon Hurley, and Eric Edwards. It all went to LSU in the same season. Yeah. But Washtenaw Christian's going to try and run at you, and their defense is, you know, very senior laden. They got a good D line, good DBs. It's going to be athleticism from Calvary again. They throw the ball against a run team. It's two separately different types of teams going at it, Jason. Uh, Calvary, if they can't throw the ball, it's going to be a problem right away. So, you know, I think, oh, yeah. I think Washtar Christian, if they can shut down the pass, then it'll be a long night. But if they can't stop Calvary's passing game, it's going to be the other way. You know, that means yep. Washtar Christian's got to sub- sustain these long drives and keep up. So it's going to be an interesting game. Um, I think it'll be close because I think Calvary can throw the ball. And I think Washita Christian can defend, but I, I think it'll be a close game. I've still got Washita Christian winning this, but Calvary Baptist being a young team. I mean, it's like I said, they're, they're going to be the youngest team maybe in this whole, this whole three, four day event of any team getting to a state championship game, Jace. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and I actually have the same championship game and the same winner. So I have a uh, Walshaw Christian and Calvary Baptist in the game, and oh, like you said, like with Walshaw Christian being so senior laden, and Calvary being one of the youngest teams out there, I think that that's what that's why I picked them. Uh, that to be the difference. They were in that game last year. 
uh, Hunter Herring had himself a great game last year in the state championship game. And, uh, and that's an interesting point you made about two different styles. And uh, we it's a same topic we always hit on, but it's whoever style is going to win is going to win the game. So, uh, and they both spread the football around. It's just they do it different ways. Uh, like you said, Calvary Baptist, they spread the football to throw. Well, uh, Wall Star Christian, they spread everybody out and they, they run the football with Hunter Heron. So, uh, two different styles of play. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see who wins that game. But that Vermillion Catholic game in Wall Star Christian was a classic. And uh, it was about two of the best quarterbacks in the state this year with Leje and Herring. And it was a classic. And uh, it came down to a two point conversion at Wall Star Christian stop. So, classic game. And and remember what happened last year with Calvary and Walshaw played, and it was a classic game, too, uh, between those two teams. And now they get to play each other in the state championship game. But I think that senior leadership and having that experience will be the difference in that in, uh, in that case. you got to take your hat off to Calvary, Coach Rodney Ginn, because he has a new quarterback, and he's back. How many teams in Class 1A have a new quarterback and they get back to the state title game? Not many. You know, have Yeah, you- and I was – I was really surprised because I thought last year's team would be the one going to the state championship game for Calvary. So, yeah. man, this is a great job of Coach Keen. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, Landry Liddy's the first year to play. He's a junior, and he looks better than the guy that started four years for him and threw 10,000 yards, who's now at LSU Eunice, their quarterback from yeah. uh, the last four years prior to this year. But, yeah, Calvary was loaded. They had a guy named Eric Reed last year signed with Auburn. Um, right. I mean, yep. they, were, they were more talented last year, and they and, and like you said, they get there this year. That's kind of how it works sometimes. Uh, we're going to take a yep. break. When we come back, we're going to have more. And later in the show, LSU, we're going to talk LSU, Florida, the Saints, coaching changes, also recruiting. Is this Wednesday the first signing day? But we still got high school football to talk about. And when we come back, we're going to get to the public side. We're going to talk about Class 1A and talk about they have one more game to play before it's decided who goes to state championship game. So one more game's on the line. We're going to talk about Class 2A, 3A, 4A, and 5A, all on the public side, and then we'll get to LSU, Florida. We'll get to the Saints and much, much more. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report. We'll be right back. Parents, are you looking for advice on getting your high school athlete recruited by the right college? Lee Brakeen is your answer. Lee has been doing it for over 30 years. He knows the ropes, and more importantly, he knows the people. Lee offers turnkey service from evaluation, creating highlight tapes in the correct format, and complete guidelines for effective communication with the schools. No matter the sport, girl or boy, no matter what grade your child is in, let Lee Brakeen help match your child to the right college fit. Go to our website, LAFootballMagazine.com and get connected today. Welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm Lee Burkeen, your host, and our guest today is Jace Lejeune, our, our editor for Louisiana Football Magazine, also for our website, and he helps us with our podcast as our producer. And we're going to be talking later in the show, LSU Florida, and, and, and again, recruiting and coaching changes. But we're going to continue on in high school football playoffs we're going to talk about Class 1A. And, Jace, uh, I got it wrong, completely, well, half wrong on, on my predictions here. I picked Oak Grove to win it, so they're going to be in uh, it. Well, I can't say they're going to be in it. Homer's going to want to tackle me right now. Right, right. But, <laughs> but I picked Oak Grove to get there, and, you know, it's, it's looking like there's going to be a different opponent because I picked Haynesville to be the other opponent, so Haynesville got eliminated. Now, we've got a game left, and we've got four teams to get down to two. So there's a semifinal game, and Oak Grove's playing homer. And I'm a little nervous about my pick. I, I don't want to say nervous because either way, I'm, I'm happy whoever wins this game. But homer, yeah, led by head coach Richie Casey, a former homer player, former Louisiana Tech receiver, it's done a phenomenal job on Homer High School. They're battle-tested. I mean, they played North Cato, who was very good. They played a lot of good teams in, you know, in the Shreveport area. They played Calvary Baptist. They played a lot of good teams. And then Oak Grove, man, they're built like a 5A team. They're one of the biggest teams. They're a power team. 
This is going to be one of the great games of the weekend, Jace. Homer and Oak Grove. Homer's not a very big team, but they're super athletic. Yeah, fast and athletic. So you got two different types of teams going at it. You got one that can score at any time in Homer, and you got Oak Grove that just keeps the ball eight minutes a drive, and they got 280 pound O line, and they just power you, just overpower you. Um, it, you know, Homer's going to give this more of a game than my original prediction. And I wouldn't be shocked if Homer pulled an upset, but I'm going to stay with my pick to Oak Grove winning this game because I picked Oak Grove to win it all two years in a row. Ryan has done a great job as the head coach. Gregory, who played at Oak Grove. And then on the other side, we're finally going to have a school that's going to get to the state championship for the first time. And it's going to be yeah. it's either going to be Grand Lake or East Iberville. And this is exciting to me. I, I, I love schools that have never been. I love I love the the no name schools like Grand Lake, who your dad had to play at East Iberville, and now East Iberville yeah. has a chance to go to their first. And these are all kids your dad coached for three years. Yep. So, I didn't have I didn't have these two teams here in my bracket. No, and I thought Haynesville would be here with Centerville, so I was wrong, which I'm glad. I mean, these yeah. are two programs, but. I mean, who do we take Grand Lake East Iberville, Jace? I mean, this is – I don't even know who to take. They're so even. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, its going to be a toss-up, and I got that side wrong, too. I had Haynesville playing uh, Overland, so that's what I had originally. And, yeah, East Iberville, heading to this year, they had their most senior-led team, and everybody was coming back. And I mean, it's a really good football team coming back overall. Uh, so you know that this this was East Iberville's best chance to go to a state championship, and they're taking full advantage of that. And then look on the other side, uh, Coach Wainwright, who was a former sulfur coach, he's coaching Grand Lake, and he's done an excellent job with that program. And th- this year, there were some teams in the Lake Charles area that di- unfortunately didn't get to play this year. Right. So Grand Lake was able to get a, got a couple of guys coming in. Uh, helping with their football team, and they got a lot of great guys. And you, you talked. We actually had this kid on their show. Uh, um, I guess like a couple Eli, months Eli ago, Fountain. Eli Fountain. Yeah. Yes, sir. So he's a big time playmaker for them. But it's going to be an evenly matched game. And we were talking about it earlier that, it, I mean, it could be anybody uh, playing. I feel like Oak Grove is going to win on the other side of the bracket. Um, you were talking about Casalen Barnes and Logan Sport, and Oak Grove be that team. 67 to 14. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that shows you how tough Oak Grove is going to be. I think Homer's a really good football team, and they got a lot of great athletes. They beat Haynesville by like almost 40 points. Yeah. Uh, so, it shows you how good Homer is. But I got Oak Grove playing the state championship game. I'm going to go with Grand Lake uh, because I feel like they got a lot of guys that are well coached. Uh, they got a lot of talent coming in, and these kids, I mean, they really believe over there that can win. But East Riverville, they defeat Haynesville uh, in the playoffs. So how many teams can really say that? But it's going to be a close, competitive game. This game played when my dad was the head coach over there. They played in overtime, uh, and East Riverville came up on top. So I felt a lot of those Grand Lake seniors were on that team and remember that game. So it's going to be a battle. But I have, in the state championship, I have Oak Grove playing Grand Lake. And if Grand Lake wins, it's going to be a great human interest story because they didn't think they'd play football after the hurricane. They thought it was over. And so right. this will be the, 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 the feel-good story of the year if they make it because they might end up being the only Lake Charles team. I did. We'll talk about it later, but Lake Charles College Preps, the only team from the area that could possibly go. Yeah. Um, and I've been pulling for these Lake Charles teams because of what they've been through, and, and also these Alexandria teams. You know, a lot of Alexandria people were right. affected by the hurricane as well. And we'll be talking about Ash having that big win over Zachary later in the show in, in 4A. But we're going to – again, I'm going to stick with Oak Grove as my winner. Yep. And and if Grand Lake gets there, it'll be like David versus Goliath or East Iberville. But, hey, that's what this Either is way. about. Either way, yeah. When we continue, we're going to talk about Class 2A. Uh, all these divisions on the public side, there's a game left to decide who goes to the Superdome in each classification. The, the private side, everybody's punched their ticket. And the way it works, if you don't understand and you're listening to the show today, basically the private schools get a week off to rest until the public schools are finished. 
and then then they'll all play their games on, on one week in Turpin Stadium in Natchitoches, Louisiana. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk about LSU, Florida, the Saints, and coaching changes and recruiting after we get in with the high schools. But when we come back, we're going to talk about Class 2A. We'll be right back. Listen, whatever you're driving right now, Tommy Harvey wants it. Bring it in to Harvey Subaru, Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City, or John Harvey Toyota. They're paying big bucks for all trades right now. They'll cut you a check right there. Tell them Lee sent you. <clears throat> Welcome back. You listen to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Burkeen. Our guest today is Jace Lejeune, our editor, um, and for Louisiana Football Magazine and also LA Football Magazine, our website. We're going to talk today. We're continuing on. LSU, we'll talk about them later in the show and the Saints. But right now, we're going to go to Class 2A as our topic for the high school playoffs. Jace, it was a pretty uh, amazing win for M- Manny over A. Mead. I, I, I knew A. Mead had some talent by watching him week seven or week eight this year against St. Helena Central. And, and by the way, St. Helena Central had to run into a phenomenal general trass. And, yeah. And they were both really close games to where now Manny's playing general trass, who's, a, who's the feel-good story of the year in North Louisiana. Yes, yeah, Cinderella team this year. Yeah, General Trask started the season by blanking Evangel Christian, which was the biggest win in their program history. Then they beat St. Helena. Then they won playoff game. I mean, this is this is the year that nobody ever thought that General Trask would be in this position. They're going to play Manny mm-hmm. over to the Dome. And if in my, and most people say, well, Manny's going to win. And I, look, I've picked Manny to go to the Dome and win it all. They're my pick. Um, but... I'm so happy for General Trask to be in this position. And you know what? If you talk to Homer, if you talk to North Caddo, if you talk to Haynesville, if you talk to any of these powerhouse programs, they'll tell you General Trask has a chance to beat Manny. Oh, they do. And, again, we got power against athletics. I mean, athletic Mm -hmm. team in General Trask, very athletic. Yep. Great running backs and great speed. Against Manny's powerful run game, they're not a throwing team. Mm-hmm. Just they got a big O line, they got big backs. They look like a small SEC team playing high school football. Yeah, they do. And coach does a great job at Manny, Jess Curtis. But Jim mm-hmm. Trask is the Cinderella team that is knocking on the door to go to the dome in their greatest season ever in the history of their program. On the other side, you got Mangum, who I did pick to go to the Dome to play Manny, they have to beat Kinder first. And Kinder, I didn't think would go early on. I saw him play earlier this year. And then as time has gone on, they've become a really good team. And they're very good on defense. They're just a solid team that believes. I mean, it's a program that's that's been to the Dome, you know, a couple of times in the last seven years. And now they're trying to go to Turpin Stadium in Natchitoches. But – I've still got Mangum winning against Kinder, and I still have Manny winning against General Trask. So I still have a Manny Mangum matchup, and that's going to be a great game in in the Turpin Stadium in Natchitoches. But I think I think Mangum will will be a a, a tough test for Manny. But I thought A Meat was probably the best team they were going to play, Jace, talent wise. Yeah, yeah. Mangum, I agree. Mangum's probably right under them in talent, even though they were ranked higher. Mm-hmm. But, you know, hey, when this is said and done, it might be Kinder in general trash. You never know. But I'm going to stick with my two picks. I'm going to stick with Manny winning it because they're angry. They, they've had, you know, runner-ups in the Dome. They've had where they've lost in the semis a couple of years. Yeah. Um, they're ready to win it all again. And I think Manny's going to be determined – to beat the General Trask team this Friday and then win it all against either Kinder or Mangum. What do you think of this? Yeah, it was going to be a tricky game for Coach Kurz. I'm sure he want, he definitely want to get through this game because not only did they have to play a meet and with all the talent that they have, but they didn't play any playoff games prior. Two, because yeah, the first two, two, two forfeits, right? Two, back two forfeits. Back. So they're coming right in it just not – Having any playoff games this year and just getting right to forget like like right to playing. Imagine you're just you're going to the playoff and you have to play a semifinal game your first like your first round technically because you have to go through two rounds and not playing anybody. So it was a 
It wasn't going to be a great matchup for Manny. They pulled it off uh, because of all the skill players Amy had. And Amy actually had a chance to win the game. They dropped a Hail Mary at the very end. And uh, it could have set them in a matchup against General Travis. But Manny was able to hang on. And, I mean, this is another athletic team, like you, like you mentioned, General Travis and all the skill position players that they have. So it's going to be a tough one again for Manny to play a similar team like that. But, uh, I mean, with that experience playing a very athletic and talented team and Amy and pulling through, uh, I think that Manny will will go to the Super – I mean, not the Superdome, but right, right. Natchez, Northwestern. I got to keep yeah, catching yeah, myself I'll there. Too. So. <laughs> so I got Manny in the state championship game. And like you said, though, I mean, they, they are very tough. they got Terrence Williams at running back, and he is a um, just a freight train coming through. He is a load. And uh, that big offensive line, they got another running back that's really good. He's more of their speed guy. But that's the key. Can you stop Manny's running game? Because they are very vulnerable if you stop their running game, uh, knowing that they are – just a run first offense. But that is a big question for General Traff and anybody else left in the playoffs. If you can stop their running game, you have a shot at winning them, at, at being them. But if you can't, it's going to be a long night for you. Uh, so, but I do have May going to the state championship on the other side. You mentioned Kinder. It seems like Coach Fusilier, every year the team plays their best in the playoffs. And they had a couple year run, I mean, two or three years in a row of going to the state championship. They just, this is where they play their best football. So uh, I'm not too surprised that they're in this game. Mangum, I actually had Faraday on the other side. They lost the Brown and probably the biggest upset in the playoffs so far uh, overall. But Mangum, they, they, they're they another strong running game as well, big offensive line. They kind of match a lot of things with Manning too. So I still think it's going to be Manning and Mangum now since Faraday is out. That was my other team I was uh, thinking about about going to the state championship game as well. So I see Manny Mangum advancing. And I think Cam Wilmore needs a big game running the ball against Kinder. Cam is a 210-pound running back yep. that has a, a lot of power. And, and it's going to be tough for Kinder because the quarterback at Mangum's 210 pounds too. And, and Mangum has those tall receivers. And their defense is very underrated. And they've got two senior O-linemen at Mangum that will sign college scholarships in the second signing day, which will be – uh, in February, not the first signing day, which is this Wednesday. We're going to go ahead and, and take a break. We'll be back, and we're going to have Class 3A and talk about the four teams that are left in Class 3A to try and get down to two teams for a state championship game. That's Madison Prep, Church Point, and on the other side, Lake Charles College Prep, Union Parish. It's going to be two great games. We'll talk about that when we come back later in the show. We'll talk about LSU Florida, coaching changes, and also the Saints – which did not show up Sunday, <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll be back in just a moment. Looking for a used car? Harvey Artos has three dealerships, which means three times the used vehicles. They've got everything from fuel-efficient compacts to luxury models, even hybrids, and certified pre-owned with a warranty. Check out John Harvey Toyota, Harvey Subaru, or Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City. Welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Burkeen. Our guest today is Jace Lejeune, our editor for Louisiana Football Magazine and also LAFootballMagazine.com. We're going to talk Class 3A football playoffs in this segment as our topic is Class 3A. Jace, we've got Madison Prep and Church Point. And on the other bracket, we've got Lake Charles College Prep, Union Parish. I picked St. James to go play Lake Charles, Lake Charles College Prep in the state championship game. So I have one team left. St. James was defeated by Church Point, which is impressive. Look, I'm not shocked. But I, I just had picked St. James because they were just used to going. They won the state championship last year. They had a good team back. Savion Jones, a lot of talent. Chaz Preston. Right. But Church Point's defense is a defense I pointed out on the show. They have two Division One nose guards. They've got a great safety mm -hmm. that's made our All Louisiana team. They've got a really good team actually, and they've been they've been knocking on the door for years. They, this is a, this is a program, Church Point, that has always been close. You know, they've either made the quarterfinals or they've made the semifinals. They've never been able to get to the state championship game, and I'm pulling for them. But 
Madison Prep's in the same boat. They've come so close to getting to a state championship game also. So we're going to have a first-time school go to a state championship game, Jace, either way. so Yeah, I think Madison Prep went a couple of years ago, but they're still looking for their first chip, like, win, I think. Uh, but, yeah, either way, both these teams haven't been there that often. Yeah, Madison made the semis and were beat three, four years ago when uh, Mike Roach was the coach. Right, and right. his son, Malcolm, who's with the Saints, who I thought LSU should have signed him, but he went to Texas. Yeah. Um, that's when Madison Prep lost the semifinal game. It was about about five years ago, actually. That's when they were all on that team, and Coach Roach was the coach. But, I'm, you know, neither one of these teams I had picked to be in this position, so I'm going to go – I'm going to go with Madison Prep and Chris, their quarterback, Keon Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's blossoming. And all these people, everybody's talking about Walker Howard, Eli mm -hmm. Holstein, Zachary, right. Walker Howard, St. Thomas Moore, you know, uh, Arch Manning, Newman. Right. Our young quarterback at Woodlawn and Baton Rouge. And I can give you seven or eight more quarterbacks. And then you got to talk about Keon Chris. He's another one who's a junior. Mm -hmm. He's got a cannon arm touch. He reminds me of a lot of these quarterbacks you see at Clemson, like Devontae yeah. Watson, who can throw on the run and he just creates. I mean, he's the real deal. He's a junior. He's going to be a class 222 guy. But, you know, when Madison Prep was playing their past playoff game against Jennings, you know, Jennings couldn't stop their passing game. It just They just couldn't stop it. Mm -hmm. and it, kept, yeah. it kept Etienne off the field. And, yep. and so I think the same thing could happen here with Church Point. If Church Point can't sustain drives, and Church Point has a really good defense. Like I said, they got a couple mm -hmm. of 300-pound nose guards, a really good safety. But I just think, think Madison Prep is, is, is kind of like a meet, but they're a little more experienced. Have, they have a ton of talent. They're huge on O-line. They're D-line. Jace, they have a six foot five, two 245 245-pound sophomore DN that's going to be yeah. – one of the top recruits in the country next year is a senior. Actually, he's a junior right now. And he came out from mm -hmm. the basketball team. And their D-line's 280. You know this. Their O-line's 290, 300 pounds across. And, and, and now they got the quarterback they've always wanted. Yeah. And yeah, they've the, always had skill talent. Yeah. And on the other side, Lake Charles College Prep is the most talented team skill-wise. Yeah. Maybe in the state on offense. Again, and they're taking on Union Parish, the best powerful team in Class 3A. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a heck of a matchup between, you know, guys that they have five guys that run four or five in the 40, Lake Charles College Prep, four, uh, four committed to D1 schools, by the way. And Union Parish mm -hmm. has the best offensive line in Class 3A. And Union Parish has the best running back in Class 3A. Yeah. So. Yeah. We've got two great games here, Jace. And, and again, I'm, I'm going with Madison Prep in the Super – I wanted to say Superdome. Turpin Stadium in Natchitoches. I'm going Madison Prep, who – I didn't have this pick. It was St. James. So, Madison Prep against Lake Charles College Prep. I'm going to stick with my other pick. i got to change my winner now. I had picked St. James to win it. <laughs> I'm going to pick Lake Charles College Prep to win it all. Another feel-good story out of Lake Charles. But Union Parish – don't get mad at me. I just you know, I got to pick somebody, and this 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 Lake Charles College prep game is going to go. It might even go in overtime. Yeah, it's a it's two conflicting styles, like you said. The athletic skill position, spread it out, uh, get your skill players the ball against a tough, physical downhill. Like they're going to hit you in the mouth for you know forty eight minutes or. Whatever, how many times they play in high school now? Uh, yeah, about 48 minutes. But yeah, just looking at both matchups, I actually had so yeah, I mean, we were both rolling the upside bracket. I had Jennings going to the state championship, but their defense was vulnerable this year, and uh, it was a bad matchup for them. And then, I mean, I didn't really expect Church Point to defeat St. James, so I was, was kind of really surprised by that. Uh, so a matchup that not a lot of people were really expecting. Uh, if you look at the beginning of the bracket. But uh, Church Point, they were able to play a team, a similar team with athletic guys like St. James, so that will help them. But I really like, 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 
like you mentioned, I really like their athleticism. I like their balance between they, they are big, they're fast, in terms of mass and prep. They got a lot of great athletes, and they're big. So we have size and speed. That is a difficult combination to play against in high school. So I do have mass and prep going to the state championship game. And on the other side, of the way, I'm on the opposite side of you there, too. So I actually have Union Parish uh, from the beginning going to the state championship. I like how physical they are, the running game. Uh, Trey Holly, you mentioned the running back. He's had himself a great junior season. I mean, actually, a sophomore, sophomore season. Yeah. I think he's he's a sophomore. sophomore. Yeah. yeah, so uh, he's had himself a great season. And I really like in this in this time in December uh, when it's getting cold and bad weather starting to be factor and everything, it's going to be those big uh, winning teams that play good defense that are going to prevail through. And a lot of these teams left in the bracket are those teams. So I like – you and Parrish being able to run the football, keep that explosive play Charles Prep offense off the field and advance to the state championship game. So that would mean it would be a matchup between Madison Prep and uh, Union Parish. And I really like Union Parish uh, to go all the way and win the state championship. And that that would be another state championship for Coach Five Four and the Farmers. Yeah, any of these four teams can win it all. They're all talented teams. I mean – Probably the <clears throat> probably the least talent team offensively would be Church Point, but they have a great defense. Church Point has a great defense. And yeah. You know, Lake Charles College Prep, they were already good this year. And then when the mm-hmm. hurricane hit, they picked up five transfers from yeah. other schools that were star players. And that's what makes them so tough in this game, I think, Jace, is because now they picked up more linemen. And they picked mm-hmm. up a great linebacker from Washington, Marion, who's 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 changed their defense, and they've got a big D line already. But yeah, you know, if Lake Charles Prep doesn't get big plays, Union Parish wins this, controlling the clock. <clears throat> but on the other hand, if if Union Parish gives up those big plays, yeah, me and you, me and you could be wrong by the tenth of a minute, minute <laughs> second. There. So. This is going to be a close game, I think, either way with those two. And then the other game's going to be close, too. I think Church Point's going to be tough on defense. And, you know, it, like I said, one good thing is we're going to have a, a school go for the first time out of Mass and Prep Church Point. And, and on the other side, Lake Charles College Prep, if they win, it will be their first appearance. Yeah, it'll be their first, yep. So we always like some new teams to get in that have never been. We're going to go and take a break when we come back. I'm losing my voice here. <clears throat> when we come back, we're going to talk about Class 4A. And later in the show, LSU-Florida game. And also the Saints and coaching changes and recruiting. We'll, we'll be right back. So, hey, guys. Just wanted to take a minute to tell you about Harvey Autos. If you need a new or used car, there's three great dealerships right here worth checking out. John Harvey Toyota. Harvey Subaru and Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City. Welcome back. You listen to the Low Sports prices, Gallery Report. I'm your honest host, people. Lee Burkeen, our guest Tell them Lee sent you. It's Jace Lejeune, our editor, and also with LAFootballMagazine.com. Helps us with that with some articles. And Jace, on our website, I know that you uh, have been working on um, Archbishop Hannon High School and some other s- schools. Yeah. And I know we're going to try and get an article up on Jesuit, their seniors in New Orleans, and, and some other teams, mm-hmm. you know, as we go. Right. Um, we're going to talk Class 4A in this segment. Another interesting deal. I lost one of my picks that lost. Westgate had lost to Neville. So I had Westgate going to the Dome against Edna Carr. Mm-hmm. I still have Edna Carr as the winner again. They're still in it. So they beat a good Eunice team. Edna Carr destroyed Eunice, and Eunice is good. Yeah, he was really good. Yep. And Neville beat a good Menden team, just to show you how good Neville's become. And then Karen Crow, I'm sorry for your dad at Plaquemine. They yeah. <laughs> Karen Crow put up 81. Now, I'm sure coaches aren't happy about that, but, you know. No. Uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, I heard. Yeah, I heard. It, now, First half, they scored 55 points, and they kind of knew that they had a chance to have the most points ever scored in a Karen Crow game. 
So through, through the second half, they uh, can't cope a lot of their stars in until they were able to get 81, which would beat their record. So they, uh, they knew that their score record would be intact uh, for most points in the game. So Karen Crow was very motivated to get to that 81. So when they did, they fell a lot of guys out. Karen Crow better hope there's not a rematch in the future. Because um, Plotkin <laughs> right. is young and Karen Crow is going to lose a lot of seniors. So that could happen. Yeah. They, could, they, could, they could hook up again next year in the playoffs. So, But anyway, right. we've, got, we've got Karen Crow, super talent, Kendall Williams running back, uh, Travion Falk. Kevin Fox, nephew, great offense, great defense, got great defensive line, Tony Leger on one D. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've got some great DBs at Carolina. Yeah, Bailey Despani. Yep. One of the best I've seen. Bailey's got a lot of talent. I think he's LSU good. And then they're playing Neville, who has come on since I've seen mm-hmm. him against Rustin early in the year. The thing about Neville, they've played a lot of top teams, and, and they lost some games early, but it's made them better. Neville's got a great run game. They got the best offensive lineman in the country, who's a junior. Yeah, right, He's right, legit. Will Campbell. Will Campbell's phenomenal. He's the best I've seen since Andrew Whitworth coming out of Monroe. Yeah, and, yeah. And then on the other side of the bracket, you've got – and I'm glad this is not in the state championship game because these guys have played, what, three times <laughs> in the finals? Yeah. And I think Warren Easton's glad it's not the state championship game. It's the semis. Warren Easton plays Edna Carr. Now – I predicted Edna Carter to win it all, but let me tell you something, and we all saw this happen with the Saints the other day. You know, they're supposed to win, blah, 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 and everybody's saying Warren Easton can't win, and Warren Easton lost to Edna Carr two games, two state championship games in very close games. Yeah. If anybody's motivated in the semifinals in the state, it's going to be Warren Easton against Edna Carr, and Warren Easton has the talent to beat Edna Carr if there's anybody that can beat him. Mm-hmm. So, with that being said, it's going to be a great game. I don't think Edna Carr – I don't expect Edna Carr to beat them 70-10 to 10 like they've been beating some teams. No, no. And Warren Easton, if they would, if they were to make the state championship game, since I, my winner's out of the other side, I'm going to pick <laughs> – I'm going to pick Karen Crow to beat Neville. Mm-hmm, yep. So, I'm going to go with Edna Carr and Karen Crow. Mm-hmm. Uh, as my and I'm gonna stick with Edna Carr as the winner that I picked to win it, but Neville, this could go either way. And there are two teams that are similar; they're both big, they're they're both running teams. So this is gonna be a quick game, not a lot of passing. And whoever has the ball last wins this Neville Karen Crow game. This might be like a twenty to seventeen game or twenty yeah yeah twenty eight twenty four or thirty one twenty eight. And you know what's scary, Jace? Both of these teams have good special teams. Yeah, they do. So each team has a good kicker. Each team has a good punter. So special teams is strong. I think it's going to yeah. be. I think it's the game of the weekend. I actually do. I think Karen Crow Neville is going to be the game that could. Uh, that's going to be phenomenal. And I don't know if it'll be on TV, but I would hope that maybe that one of our local stations will pick this up. Yeah, it's going to be a classic game, and both these teams are just well balanced, well coached teams that they can win on offense, win on defense, special teams, you name it. And when you can win in all three phases, that makes yourself a very dangerous team. But my two teams are still alive there to make go. the state championship. Yeah, so Karen Crow and and Carr. So that's what I had at the beginning of it, and they're both still alive. And like you said, uh, compared to like Kinder and team like John Curtis, they, like the well-coached teams that they are just getting going in the playoffs and really find their stride. And uh, that's what they after kind of slow starts, and that's what they've been able to do. But for me, I have Karen Crow. Like you mentioned, Kendra Williams and. Uh, Tejon Falk, and you got Pre- Traylon Prejean. I mean, they got a lot of yep. really good running backs, skill position players, and they're big up front, too. Uh, they're yep. big up front on the offense and defense line. I think they're, they're all like 280 pounds across, so they're all big and physical. And I have Karen Crow. I have still my pick, obviously. So Karen Crow, the Fian Neville, and I think it's going to be a great game, too, because I, I Neville – uh, they have really come along and really shown the best what they can do. But on the other side, can Warren Ethan over just 
they've been so close every single year in being in the car. And sometimes they've had a more talented team than the car has. Yep. And they still come up just a little bit short. So can they overcome that hurdle and being in the feet in the car? Well, I'm afraid to say I don't think they do it again. I think in the, in the car is trying to go, that's crazy, Lee. Five straight state championships that they're trying to go after. That is yep. absolutely insane. But it's six and, out of seven years. Yeah, six out of seven years, too. So that's even more insane. Uh, but I have, I mean, I have to show my original picks and uh, within the car and Karen Crow. And if that game happens, if they both take care of business, that will be an exciting state championship game to watch. And if Warren Easton was to upset Edna Carr, it would have to be like 50 to 49 or something. They got to score points. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, ask Catholic High Baton Rouge that lost to Edna Carr. You know, ask Eunice, who's got a great team. Right. I mean, Eunice has one of the best offenses in 4A, and they, they just couldn't keep up with Carr. Ask Estruma. Yeah. They gave, Estruma gave up 70 some points to Edna yeah. Carr. So, Edna Carr, <clears throat> they should do an ESPN 30 for 30 on, on that school. I really do believe. Maybe I'll do one. Heck, I don't know. Maybe let's, Jason, let's get a Yeah, maybe we we'll do one. one. <laughs> let's go do one with Bryce Brown and Jabbar Jaluk, who's now at ULL as an assistant. He's yeah. a coach. and. And and all their coaches that have been there over the years, Don Coach Watney, right, right. The last twenty years at that school has been remarkable. Starting with Coach Don Watney and what they did. Mm-hmm. So, but we're going to take right. a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about Class Five A. And I got it wrong here. Both of my teams are eliminated. I had Rustin and Zachary going to the state championship game. Mm-hmm. So I got to repick teams, and uh, it happens. You know, sometimes you yeah. go, and then uh, you just you just can't continue every year. You know, you can't win them all. But <clears throat> we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about, about Class 5A. And later in the show, me and Jace, I'll talk about LSU-Florida game, Max Johnson and the game that Jarrell Cox played, I thought was phenomenal in defense. Yeah. And the game the Saints did not play Sunday. I don't, know where they were. Uh, I don't know if they were hanging out with the Raiders in Vegas or what. But anyway, we're going to be talking about football signing day. The first one is Wednesday, which I don't think you're going to see a lot of the state kids sign. It's going to be very minimal. Most of your national recruits. You know, right. And coaching, right. coaching changes. We had a lot of coaching changes. Coach Sumlin was let go by Arizona. Illinois let Smith go, the former Bears head coach. And also our big coach. Big story is Auburn letting mm-hmm. go their head coach Malzahn, that which I saw it coming. I was actually talking about it the other day, and it actually happened. You know, these things mm-hmm. don't happen overnight. They spend weeks and weeks trying to get this done. So, oh yeah, right. And to already have someone maybe named, <laughs> you've been talking to somebody for a couple of months, maybe or a month. But anyway, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, we'll be back. We'll talk about Class Five A state championship games. We'll be right back. Parents, are you looking for advice on getting your high school athlete recruited by the right college? Lee Brakeen is your answer. Lee has been doing it for over 30 years. He knows the ropes, and more importantly, he knows the people. Lee offers turnkey service from evaluation, creating highlight tapes in the correct format, and complete guidelines for effective communication with the schools. No matter the sport, Girl or boy, no matter what grade your child is in, let Lee Brakeen help match your child to the right college fit. Go to our website, lafootballmagazine.com, and get connected today. Welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Brakeen. Today's guest, he's co-piloting the show with me today. We're talking high school playoffs. We've got one classification left. Is Jace Lejeune, our editor for Louisiana Football Magazine and also with helping us with LAFootballMagazine.com. Go to our website if you want to hear about any of these teams. Jace will tell you there's a lot of work put into that magazine. There's two of them, the North copy, South copy that came out in September. And I remember there was a time, Jace, I never said we weren't going to do it. I was like a coach. We're going to do it, like play a game. We're going to do it. So, it's, yep. my, it's my livelihood, and it's my passion. And I know I told Jace, I said, 
I'm going to work through this. I'm not going to wait for them to say there's football. We're going to have it ready. At some point, there's going to be football. And if you don't work on a magazine three months in advance, you don't have one. And so mm -hmm. right. we just kept working through it. And when they announced there would be football, and I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you, God. So we were able to put it out. And, Jason, I know uh, those two magazines, I know people, a lot of them, if they're just hearing the show for the first time, let them know before we get into Class 5A about the North and South. And, and, you know, all these kids, a lot of these kids are in it that we're talking about today, a lot of these players and teams. Oh, absolutely. There are a lot of players on both North Louisiana and South Louisiana. We just had our – if I uh, know we've been doing a lot of talking with the uh, <laughs> Louisiana <laughs> team podcast uh, okay. breakdowns that he's been doing with all the Louisiana team and all the players that he's scouted, giving his expertise on that. But all those players he's mentioned, they're they're pretty much in the magazine and left there. They're brand new, and they're just you know they come in. They just joined the team after the magazine was released. But in order to get our magazine, probably the best way to do it is to go on our website. It's lafootballmagazine.com, and then when you go to the website, there's going to be a couple tabs at the top, and there's one that tells you exactly where it's at. It says Buy Magazine, so it's just pretty straightforward. You press buy magazine, and then you, you have your option of north, south. Of course, both both issues cover all the high schools and colleges, but north uh, is a little bit more in-depth with north Louisiana, and south Louisiana is a little bit more in-depth with south Louisiana. So, uh, and you also have your option of hard. You want a hard physical copy, or you want your online copy. So, uh, yeah, just go to LAFootballMagazine.com. The playoffs are still going on, so it would be it's a great guide to keep up with. Let's say you're a double fan and you need a scouting report on Karen Crow. Well, you can read up on Karen Crow and see what they bring. And uh, I mean, it's, it's the best gift right now. Christmas is around the corner, so uh, if you're uh, family members, a huge football fan, that would be a great Christmas present as well. Well, the only thing is, if you hear the show on Wednesday, we can't promise you you'll get the magazine before this Friday's game. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. You can get it. It takes about four to seven days to get it, just like any national magazine or anything you order. I mean, if you go order something from sams.com, it's going to take you four to seven days to get it. So, just realize you don't get it like the day you ordered. It's, it's impossible. I wish I could fly in the sky like Santa Claus. <laughs> I always dreamed I could just jump up and, uh, and and know some reindeer and jump up and just deliver those you know magazines. We wish we could, but we're going to go ahead and continue right. uh, Class 5A. And this is the toughest classification in the state. It's the bigger teams, the biggest enrollment schools. And there are some teams that we've talked about that could play with 5A teams. I'm not saying that, but this is this is the tough – this is the men. This is this is the big league. And I was wrong, and it's easy to get these wrong. It yeah. really is easy to get these wrong. Zachary, mm -hmm. I had Zachary going to the state championship game losing to Rustin. And Rustin had a, a tough loss 6-0. to zero. Yeah. Which was a tough loss to a great Destrahan. Destrahan's trying to go back to win a state title. They were they were runner up in two nineteen to uh, a great yep. talent of Katiana. But you know, this could have went either way and I would have been right. But anyway, Destrahan is going. They got like they have an NFL D line. Mm -hmm. Destrahan has uh you know, Eugene at quarterback, a young quarterback, right. Jai Eugene Junior, whose dad I'll watch play. I'm getting old. <laughs> Jaya Eugene Sr. was on the cover of our magazine. That's how long we've been around. Acadiana beat a very good Mandeville, shut them out. If you want to know how good Mandeville is, they've won 90% of their games the last two years, and they got shut out by Acadiana. Right. So, in Acadiana, even though they don't throw the ball well, they've never thrown the ball well, and they have four state championships. Or is it five? Four? I think it's four. And they like Five, I five, think, off the top five, of my head. Five, okay. But yeah. it's, it's, like, mm -hmm. it's like four in the last, what, 10 years? Four in the last 10 or 12 years? Yeah, yeah, but, I believe so. But you don't have to throw the ball when you have an NFL defense in a great run game and a great O-line, and Destrahan has an NFL D-line. I mean, Jace, this is a game among two teams that have eight D-1 players just on their D-lines. Yeah. 
I mean, You're right. Acadiana has four D1 guys on their D-line. Destrahan has five D1 guys. And I'm not talking about their seniors. They're juniors, sophomores, seniors. So they got two of the best D-lines in the state, maybe in the country. They, they're yeah, both I believe that. Super powerful at running back. You got a 230 pound running back at Destrahan. <laughs> Destrahan, yep. And he's 5'8. And then at Acadiana, you got five running backs that all rotate in and out, and they all look clones. They're all 5'8, 9, mm-hmm. and 80. And then you, on the other side of the bracket, Zachary was just, they just finally lost a, sh- a shootout. They've won all these shootouts over the years in the playoffs. So they mm-hmm. finally lost a shootout with Alexandria. And I think the stars are aligned because Alexandria went through a lot with the hurricane. Yeah. And Coach Bachman's been close. I mean, last year he was close. And J- Coach Bachman's quarterback, Jude Barton, he's the real deal. Shield Taylor's yeah. a real deal at tight end. And so is their receivers. they got a couple of great receivers. At Al- and they've got a good – their defense, you know, here's why I want to take my hat off and, and kneel to Bachman. Mm-hmm. Losing J- Jacoby and Gillery – and losing the, one of the best cornerbacks in the state last year, losing seven starters on defense, and you're in a position to maybe go to the Dome this year in 5A, that is unheard of in 5A, especially at Alexandria where they don't just reload on defense. It's, it takes a while. But they're going to play yeah. a West Monroe who hadn't played many games because of COVID-19. They had – this is probably the least amount of games they played in the history of their school. Mm-hmm. And everybody, right. everybody was counting the Rebels out. Including me, because I'm like, you know, mm-hmm. I'll watch yeah. them play. And they just didn't look very good. Karen Crow beat them really bad the first game of the season. Yep. But they've matured, like LSU. We're going to talk about that later in the show. They've really matured. They've played a lot of young guys. That's what's scary for everybody now. Now they got their guys back from COVID. Now they got 100 players with experience. But I'm going to, since I didn't have these two playing, I've got to pick a whole new two teams to go to the game. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, this is tough. I'm going to Cadiana. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to Alexandria. Okay, I think okay. I'm going Jude Barton, Shield Taylor, and Trevane Colbert and that high-powered offense at Alexandria, putting enough points up to beat a Western Row in a close game, the Rebels in a close game. I'm taking Acadiana's defense and their whole team overall over a young Destrahan team. Yeah, uh, and uh, I can definitely see that happen. And, and uh, just I think that the Rust and, uh, the Destrahan performance that was incredible. You talk, I mean, you were talking about their running backs with Hargrove and Wilson, the fullback, and you have another running back, and just the running game of Rustin has. Yeah. Dash your hand just completely shut it down. And actually, it was probably one of the best defense performances I've seen this year because the only touchdown, the six to nothing game, was a fumble return from that. De- so, Dash hand's defense was the one that won them the game. Right. So, uh, it shows you just how dominant the defensive line is and their front seven in general uh, with their linebackers as well. Uh, you're talking about Michael Jackson and, and those guys from Dash your hand. But they are absolutely loaded to D one, and so is a KD in with Cameron George. And uh, if you're an offensive lineman <laughs> playing in yeah. the semifinal game, it's going to be a rough game for you next week. But I think I trust the KD run running offense a little bit more uh, than Desher Hand's uh, offense right now. They're very talented, but like you said, young. Uh, so is the KD But I think they're getting it. Uh, they're maturing over the course of the year. Uh, Acadiana was my only team still left, so I didn't have any other team. Uh, I had Zachary, too, and Zachary was eliminated. But I have Acadiana. Let's make things interestingly. I have West Monroe uh, okay. to be in Alexandria. So they are really coming on, and they're playing their best football right now. And it's it, like, like, again, Lee, it's been a common theme through when we talked about this, but what style of play is going to pull through? Is it going to be Judd Barton and Shield Taylor and explosive offense? If they get their yards and their points, I don't think West Monroe will have the offense to keep up. But if West Monroe, I can see West Monroe's defense, which has been outstanding throughout the playoffs, if they can slow down Barton and that offense, and then give Jerome Williams and the running offense, Wayne Little, uh, for West Monroe, if they can get their running offense going and keep 
Alexander off the field, then they can win the football game as well. So it's about what style of play is going to win. And, uh, and that same defense wins the uh, offense sells tickets and defense wins games. Well, I'm going to go with defense on this one. I have a very – and there's going to be a defensive game in the state championship either way, but I like Acadiana and West Monroe playing for a state championship. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick Acadiana to win it again two years in a row. Yeah. I think so too. I, I think they're my favorite as well. So, and, and here's the deal. here's a, here's the reason why I'm picking Alexandria over West Monroe. They're tired of losing to West Monroe. Mm-hmm. They've lost to West Monroe. I think I don't know ten years in a row. I mean, it's, yeah, it's it's, it's 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 crazy. And they lost to West Monroe last year. And so mm-hmm. I just think they're tired. Of, and then West Monroe's offensive line is the smallest it's been in twenty five years. So yeah, it has been. That's the reason I think Alexandria could win it, because Alexandria proved to me, you go to Zachary High School, who's won three state championships what in, in the last four to five years. They've won a bunch of state championships. And you're at their field, and they're doing great. they got Eli Holstein. They've got a great team on that. I mean, they got a lot of talent at Zachary. you got yep. Chris Hilton. you got all this right. talent. And they go to Zachary, and they play defense. Mm-hmm. And it's not what you expect from Alexandria. We, we, you know, you think offense, but they hold Zachary to, what, 27 points. And mm-hmm. so I think that's why I think they can beat West Monroe, because if you can stop Zachary's offense, I think you can stop this West Monroe offense. Now, again, mm-hmm. it's going to be close. Now, I think this Acadiana Destrahan game is going to be like a 7 to nothing game. It's going to be like the last one. Yeah, right? it, it will be. It's it will be, a, be. It's going to be like might be three to nothing. You know, it might be. It might be out Alabama and LSU in two thousand eleven. That that that's probably right, what it's going to be. Right. Might be yeah. two to nothing. Might be a safety that wins it. But it's going to be down to the wire. Either one. And if if Acadiana was somehow to get upset by Destrahan, you know, I, I then I would change my pick to Alexandria winning it all. But anyway, you can't, yeah. you can't do that. You can't have two picks. So. Anyway. We'll take it one game at a time. <laughs> one game at a time, man. One game at a time. Yep. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, let's talk LSU Florida football. This is the show that we always talk. We combined it with high school football, but also LSU football. We'll be right back. We'll talk about LSU, the Florida game, and what a great, surreal feeling it is for LSU fans. One week, everything is just completely dead and silent. <laughs> And the next day, there's life. It's like a flower grew out of the ground. We'll be right back. Winning solves a lot of problems. That's right. Hello, Sports Scout Report podcast fans. This is Louisiana Football Magazine editor Chase Lejeune here to tell you that all of our Louisiana Football Magazine podcast breakdowns are available wherever you get your podcasts. Just go to LAFootballMagazine.com, click podcast at the top, and you'll be able to listen to all of our podcasting hosting sites, whether it is YouTube, Podbean, Pandora, Spotify, iHeartRadio, we have it. So make sure to go to LAFootballMagazine.com to access all of our recent episodes. And you can also go to LAFootballMagazine.com to order our North and South Louisiana Football Magazine edition. The playoffs are starting to wrap up. We have their semifinal games on Friday, as well as state championship games next week. So it'll be the perfect time to order your magazine edition to get caught up with your favorite team. So what are you waiting for? And go to LAFootballMagazine.com to order a magazine today. Welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report with Lee Burkeen. I'm the host of the show, and our guest today is Jace Lejeune, our editor for Louisiana Football Magazine. This topic, this segment, is the LSU Tigers. You know, before the game, I'm going to admit, because I admit when I'm wrong, I'm one of them people. So I'm going to admit before the Florida game, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to get a, a glass of unsweet tea. I'm not even watching the pregame. <laughs> I'm not even into it. So I'm just going to put it on for kickoff. I usually watch pregame, everything. So I'm like, well, it kicks off at, what, 6? I'm going to watch it right at 6. And I just hope LSU plays competitive for a half and, and go ahead and give the Heisman to Trask. And, and I'm probably thinking like a lot of LSU fans. I'm thinking, yep. man, this is going to be ugly. And, you know, Dan Mullen's going to pour it on. He's going to probably put up 60, maybe at least 50. And 
you know, Trask is going to throw for the NCAA record passing yards in a game, and, and Pelini's going to end up having to be, you know, taken out the game by half because he's just <laughs> over. You know, yeah. it's going to be the ugliest thing ever. And then the ball's kicked off, and LSU has a goal line stand. And I'm thinking to myself, this defense that I've seen all year with a goal line stand in the swamp? <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait, I got to watch this whole game. And I've always watched the whole game of LSU. And I'm watching it, and I'm going, you know, the goal line stand, I saw effort that I hadn't seen all year long. You know, mm-hmm. you, know you know this with your dad being a coach and me growing up a coach's son is that you, you see things. And I saw effort. Without Stingley on the field, without Eric mm-hmm. Gilbert on the field, no Jamar Chase, no Terrace Marshall, no Tory Carter. Yep. I mean, let me name thirty-two other players that weren't on the team. <laughs> we only had fifty-three scholarship players out there. <laughs> it is the, it is the freshman JV team, if you want to say that. And yeah, you got Max Johnson's first start at quarterback from Georgia, and our fans are like, "Well, he's okay." And I'm like, "Listen, wait a minute." We forget. We're in a forget society. We forget about stuff. Joe Burrow wasn't good enough to even play as a freshman at Ohio State. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Wrap your head around that. Joe Joe Burrow (laughs) was not good enough to play a down as a true freshman. This kid is a true freshman, 18 Mm -hmm. years old. He's on the road his first start. I would be freaking out. He didn't bobble the ball. He didn't bobble a snap. This guy ran the offense like he's been a starter for two years. And he ran yeah. the ball, and he ran the offense to the perfection of, I forgot he was a freshman after the first quarter. With like a left-handed Joe Burrow out there. Yeah, but, but, but to the fans that are listening, and, you, and I read a lot of internet stuff, not that I, I don't believe half of it, but you, you read stuff. And, Jace, I know you do too, but I've been watching football since 1974. And mm-hmm. – People want kids to be polished in like a play. That's where we are in society. Like, he needs to be an All-American in this game. And even though he's – he can be 15 years old, but he needs to be an All-American in this first game. I'm like, whoa, time out, time out. This guy just won a game on the road as a true freshman. And he's only played – spot play three games with T.J. Finn. Mm-hmm. Okay? Right. I think Max Johnson on his, is on his is on his way to being an All American quarterback one day for LSU. Yeah, when he he, is. when he's Joe Burrow's age, like let's just go Joe Burrow when Joe Burrow was a sophomore in college. Okay, do you know that mm-hmm. Joe Burrow didn't play a snap as a sophomore? He did not. Yep, I think was he backing up uh, JT Bear and Cordell Jones, so he was like yeah. the third string quarterback. Which is crazy enough. His red shirt junior year, he played. Well, excuse me, he didn't play as a red shirt freshman. So he didn't play. Joe Burrow didn't play his first two years of college at all, not one snap. And here is Max Johnson from Atlanta, Georgia, son of a MVP quarterback from a Super Bowl, Brad Johnson from the Buccaneers. And Jace, being a coach's son or being a a son of a dad that played pro ball. It always seems to work out, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep. It certainly does with Joe and his dad. And I mean, look at Max Johnson. Max Johnson's dad was a Super Bowl winning quarterback for the Buccaneers. So it seems like it works out when you get uh, quarterbacks with who have their dads were either co- college coaches or professional players. Or I mean, it definitely works out. And put put your head around this, Florida Gators. In my opinion, and I did the I did the homework before the game and even after the game. They have twenty seven seniors or pro juniors leaving early. I, what I did is I took all the guys that I thought would leave early for the pros and their seniors. Mm-hmm. Twenty seven. Yeah. Okay, it's the most talented Florida team in five years. It's the same team LSU barely beat last year in Tiger Stadium with just about everybody but, back but three defensive linemen. With the great 19 team they had, they, they barely won, which is crazy as well. They, yeah. did, they did lose four receivers, but they had four transfers come in from like Trevon Grimes and all these great guys that replaced them. They basically replaced the guys they lost. Mm-hmm. You know, and the Copeland kid from Pensacola, Scambia receiver, and, and this guy, they you know, 
Super right. talent. And Florida lost not only a chance at the playoffs, I think, but all in one night they lost the Heisman Trophy in one night. <laughs> they lost the chance to go to the playoffs in one night. Mm-hmm. And then they lost the chance to go to a major bowl game because if they lose to Alabama, which I think they will in Atlanta, they're, they're out of a major bowl game with three losses. That, that's just unbelievable. But uh, that, that's, the, that's the phrase they say. Oh, that's why they play the game. You know, because everybody assumed it was going to be pretty ugly in the swamp. But, hey, in the very end, you have to play the game. And that's why they play the game. And, you know, Jace, to the listeners, and there's a lot of very smart football people in the state. There's a lot of football people. That's why there's so much stress on Coach Argeron. There's a lot of talented quarterback, armchair quarterback people in the state. He... I think I think Ed deserves a chance to reboot, regardless of whose fault it is on this year. Mm-hmm. All right. Obviously, it's the head coach's fault when you lose to Missouri and Mississippi State to start off the season. Okay. Yeah. Regardless, you know he hired this guy, mm-hmm. he hired that guy. That was his defensive philosophy. That de- it's he's the head guy. But right. This game erased all the negativity. And I think this game gave LSU a hope to say, we found our quarterback, and two, we see kids are playing hard. They win a game, the biggest upset of the season in college football. And these young guys, all these freshmen, all these young guys at DB, they had freshmen that were playing. They had freshmen playing. Cole Taylor was playing for Eric Gilbert. They had yep. they had two offensive linemen get hurt in the last eight minutes. They don't even have backups, Harley. They had – right. They had all their running backs get hurt in this game. And Chris Curry came in and played the best he's played all year. And then and look at the out. secondary. Yeah, and Elias Ricks, minus that, that showboater. I don't like the showboat thing on the two-yard line. But mm-hmm. right. his second pick six of the season, quietly, four interceptions. And then yeah. York. I knew Cage York had a leg. And we could always, you know, we, you, you can always say, yeah, that guy, he can kick it 60 yards. But can he do it to win a game? Man, this guy mm-hmm. kicked a 57-yard field goal in a cloud. And it was good from, like, 63. But like, you, it was. I'm watching a game, and I know there's no way he saw the, the, the goal post. He, <laughs> I mean, for him to just uh, – and I guess they talked to him, and, uh, and they asked him what he saw, and he said he aimed the ball. That he saw, mm-hmm. the, he saw the middle. He couldn't see the side of the, the goal post, but he, he mm-hmm. aimed. What an incredible kick. And I don't even think Florida could even <laughs> make it. And then Florida's kicker had the leg, but I think Jay Ward kind of threw him off rushing mm-hmm. from the outside, and it wasn't meant to be. But Dan, it was close. Dan Mullen went from being the coach of the year in SEC to what are they going to do now? I mean, if they beat if they get beat by Alabama and Atlanta, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blowout, their season's all of a sudden a wash. And they saved Kyle Pitts yeah. for next week against Alabama, knowing how much of a mismatch problem he was for next week that they, they made LSU. And, uh, yeah, they could they could need Kyle Pitts too that night. Well, he's going to take heat for that because they look at that as an arrogant decision. And fans don't forget. You think LSU fans are tough on Argeron? Those Gators, <laughs> look, the Gators yeah. won two, sta- two national championships back-to-back with Urban Meyer. Mm-hmm. They won a championship with Danny Werfel. They've had Spurrier, right. three Heisman Trophy winners with Tebow, Werfel, and Spurrier. They got a lot of pride over there. And there's already fans saying, and I know it's, it's, it's not right because, you know, the next guy might not do as well as Mullen, but – you know, this definitely doesn't help his national signing day come this Wednesday with what happened on Saturday. Yeah. If you look, and in and, and, and the opposite aspect, LSU gets an injection of positive mm-hmm. stuff going into the first signing day on Wednesday instead of doom and gloom. And yeah, it was an opportunity. I mean, and when when, when all you hear is this negative talk. Throughout the whole time, all everybody is talking bad about you. You know the whole coaching staff at LSU was ready to put a game plan together 
and just, you know, get their best out there. And when all the opt outs is an opportunity, it's an opportunity. A lot of these freshmen and a lot of these new guys got the chance to play. Like McCollum came in there as a cornerback and I thought they did pretty well. And they he remember have been playing time. Yeah. And, uh, it showed, it's an opportunity. And, uh, I think Ed Orgeron said during like beginning of the week, that is an opportunity to see what guys are behind us, what guys are, are, are willing to stay the course and go through the adversity and, uh, you know, uh, be with us, ride or die. And, you know, Chris Curry, I mean, he, he, he did the same thing and he got his opportunity. And, I mean, a lot of guys stood up, rose up to the occasion and took advantage of it. And I hope young kids hear this today. I hope young high school kids hear this and say and learn from this. Because when these kids opt out, and you can do whatever you want, it's a, it's a, you know, everybody has to make decisions in life and live with them. But if LSU didn't have anybody opt out, I don't think they would have lost to Missouri or State. I really don't. Mm-hmm. Right, right. I think they would at least have, you know, a, a major bowl game with maybe a loss to Alabama if they didn't have any opt outs. But mm-hmm. these kids that opted out, it's not about leaving your coaches because coaches leave too. Yeah. It's about leaving your teammates who are trying to win. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I hope young kids see this that say, look, these guys, these 50, it was only 48 guys healthy by the fourth quarter, 48. Yeah. They only had two deep. These 48 players, mostly true freshmen, went over there and beat the number six team in the country, the potential Heisman Trophy winner, a team the hottest – team in the conference in the country outside of Alabama, the two hottest teams in the country, okay? Clemson's not hot this year. Neither is Ohio State. I don't care what people say. And and then you've got Max Johnson, just those beautiful touchdown throws, those touch passes that he made. I don't even think Joe Burrow could have maybe put the needle in on the one to J. Ray Jenkins. The first one was phenomenal. Um, and yeah, and speaking of those guys, like Kayshawn and Jare, they both really stood up and yeah. made a lot of plays. And how about the, 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 the call on the post to Butte, the freshman from Westgate High School, when, when Florida committed the rush and Max saw yep. it? And he saw the rush and he checked off and hit Butte that was alone. I mean, that was a Burrow type play. Mm hmm. Yeah. Because he yep. had to check off. He had to read that. And he's only 18. <laughs> yeah, he I mean, is. I mean, again, wrap that around your head if you're a listener. Joe Burrow did not play his first two years of college football. He wasn't ready. This kid's playing his first year and wins a huge one of the biggest wins in the history of L. LSU was sinking before that game. Yeah. And, and that there was changed, a lot of questions. It a changed, lot of questions. It changed a lot of it, it answered some questions. And now Argeron needs to rework his staff. He needs to bring in the brilliant people that he needs to get to make the staff like it was when they won it all in 19. I think the team's actually way ahead of maybe two years from now. These young guys will be ready next year. And and then they, they yep. need to finish with a good recruiting class with some maybe a couple of JCs, not a lot of them, but maybe a couple of the right Cole Tracy's coming in. Um, mm-hmm. you know, a couple of immediate guys that can help the team. But they do have some young linemen. They have got kids that aren't playing like Dummerville from Florida, the Xavier Hill kid from Olive Branch, Mississippi on the O-line. Right. Hopefully Bradford and Cordell Thomas will get healthy. I know they're not healthy. Yep. That's, not, that's why they're not playing. Right. And actually, I would hope maybe Kerry Vincent would come back to school. Mm-hmm. And maybe Tyler Shelvin could come back to school, even though you opt out doesn't mean you're going pro. Yep. And if you can get these guys back and you get Gilbert back, and uh, and finish strong in recruiting, then they'll actually be because Florida and Alabama is you know Alabama will be Bama, but they're both losing right. a lot of players. And Jace T.J. Finley, I, I think he's a great kid from Ponchatoula. Me and you've had these yeah. talks. He's got a cannon arm, but he's not. He doesn't fit this offense. He, mm-hmm. he can't move. Yeah. He's not a. He can't run this. This is an offense where you have to be able to run. Yeah. And I just think you know that's what made Burroughs so really good was that he could run the ball. And here's a stat to look at on third down and against Florida, 
Max Johnson converted every third and one. There was five of them with his legs. Yep. That's what Burrow did yep. last year. Right. You're exactly right. And Jay Ward had a heck of a game, the young DB from Georgia. Uh, Elias Ricks. And look, Emory, yeah, Jabril Cox. Yeah, and, and Jabril Cox played the greatest game I've ever seen from a guy 6'3", 230, guarding DB, guarding receivers in the flats. Yeah, right. Can you imagine? Was, can you imagine the Pittsburgh Steelers or the Ravens drafting him as a safety? I can see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you see why LSU was so high on him, why he was an All America, All American at North Dakota State. Uh, just and there, there were some ups and downs this year, but what he can do well is in coverage, and he can he does well in space, and it shows you his what he can be and why he was. I'm regard as a you know early second round pick or a late first round pick before you know, you know it's crazy. He's going to be a nickel corner if he wants to be in the NFL at six three two. <laughs> yeah, and I think he's going to be a first round pick. I really do to a great team late in the first round because he is a he's a Swiss Army knife on defense and he's really not a linebacker. But LSU tried mm-hmm. to put him at linebacker because they didn't have anybody. Right, and fans were angry. But they didn't realize he's not where they have him. He's where he's at because that's where they needed him. And another thing, Jacoby Stevens, who I hope comes back too because he gets another mm-hmm. year. Right. He's not a line. He's not a DB, but that's where they need him there. They have nobody yeah. else. And so mm-hmm. Jacoby will be able to move back if he comes back to linebacker where he was last year where he would blitz. But but fans need to understand, I guess, to just just football, no football, is that kids are playing at a position at LSU where they didn't have anybody at all, nobody. So you're playing people out of position, and they don't look good because they don't. That's not their position. But you got to know football a little bit to realize that. But but Cox, that game, I mean, lining, I think he'd have helped on Pitts. I really think. I really think Jabrell Cox would have shut Pitts down a little bit. I know Pitts might have caught four balls, but he wouldn't have caught eight or nine. I don't think against him. I really don't. Yeah, he was going to be he was going to be the guy most likely to come, and he did well against uh, Wademeyer from Texas A and M. He, he did well in down. coverage against him. He, he shut him down. Yeah, so, and he's a first round pick. Uh, yep. Uh, yes, indeed. Sorry for Florida Gator fans if you're listening. Sorry, y'all are not going to win the Heisman now. And not go to the playoffs. I think this hurts A and M's chances to go to the playoffs because their best win. Yeah, because that's what the one win. Yep. Right. Right. And I really believe that they're going to let Ohio State in this if they beat Northwestern, which they'll beat Northwestern. They're going to punch a ticket with five wins, Jace. Yep. Mm-hmm. And in Cincinnati, uh, I think they might take Cincinnati over A and M. I really do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's cool. we'll see what the conference championships are like because, you know, Notre Dame and, and Clemson, if, if Clemson just defeats Notre Dame, a close game, both those two teams will be in. Right. And then uh, Alabama, I think regardless, uh, they'll be in, win or lose. And then the question is, uh, Ohio State, if Ohio State takes care of business, I mean, those are your four teams. Uh, don't count out Oklahoma being a two-loss team winning their conference over A&M. Yeah, and Iowa State is in that game too. So and Iowa yeah. State's like seven, I think. And Iowa State, they beat Oklahoma earlier this year. So they do it again. There might be any conversation as well. Plus, it hurt Texas A&M not getting to play Ole Miss. Um, and yeah. That, that's one less game on their resume. But then again, Ohio State doesn't have many games. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the New Orleans Saints. It's going to be tough, but I want to talk about it a little bit. And we talk about recruiting come Wednesday it's the first signing day in the country, but I think this is mostly, and it's always been this way for the major top 25 programs. And most of the top 25 programs are not going to sign their whole class. But most kids, if you're a mom or dad listening to this show, 95% of the kids in Louisiana are not going to sign Wednesday because they're taking the top three, 400 kids in the country. Those are the ones that are going to be committing. Those are the ones that had already visited the campuses when they were sophomores you know, in high school. We're going to go ahead and take a break. And, Jace, hold that thought. We'll be right back. We're going to be back with the New Orleans Saints. We'll talk recruiting. We'll be back with Jace Lejeune. I'm Lee Burkeen. We'll be right back. 
Listen, whatever you're driving right now, Tommy Harvey wants it. Bring it in to Harvey Subaru, Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City, or John Harvey Toyota. They're paying big bucks for all trades right now. They'll cut you a check right there. Tell them Lee sent you. Welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report. I'm your host, Lee Burkeen. Our guest is Jace Lejeune. This segment, our topic is going to be the New Orleans Saints. And, Jace, I'll let you give your three cents. I'm going to do my little dialogue real quick. And I, I felt this way going into the game that when you play a team that's not re- very good in the NFL, the difference between college is college guys don't get paid. In the pros, you get paid, and you're motivated to do well because you want to re-sign with someone. You don't want to get cut. Plus, it's just like in human nature if people say you can't win, and you're playing in Philly. It's always cold or snowing, and the Saints don't do well on the road. And two, Tashawn, I think as a quarterback, he's not evolved yet. We all know that, so I'm not upset because he's not a quarterback yet. And he he was exposed a little bit in that game. He struggled throwing it. Peyton didn't call a great game. He's a great coordinator. And then the defense, which shocked me, though, the Saints defense gave up 200-something yards rushing and 100 of it. Yeah, that was the biggest surprise. That was the biggest surprise. And the the Saints defense had zero sacks. So Mm. when you don't get a sack, and they're averaging, what, three or four sacks a game, and the Eagles have, what, 18 players out for the game? Yeah. I mean, you should win this game by a touchdown or two in the NFL. And they still lost 24-21, but it's just they were in a fog. They looked flat. They didn't look good offensively. Mm-hmm. They didn't look good defensively. Kamar didn't look great. Thomas was okay. The uh, the quarterback for the Saints, Hill, did not. He, looked, he didn't look comfortable. He missed a lot of open throws. Um, the defense did not put any rush on Hurts. They couldn't contain him. He looked like the old college Alabama Hurts running on LSU. Mm-hmm. And, yep. The, the, it just I mean, I can't believe the Saints' run game defense was not there. I mean, e- the Eagles ran the ball, and I wouldn't say the Eagles have great running backs. They really don't. They got solid running backs. Yeah, Miles Sanders is pretty good, I would say. But, uh, he's okay. And, and, he's you know, okay. Boston Scott from Zachary's okay. and then you know, But they just did they, – they look bad in every way from special teams – Offense and defense, they just look bad in all three levels. And I didn't think Coach Payton called a good game. And he's a great – look, he's a genius. Mm-hmm. But I don't think the play calls fit that game. They, they, did some, they did some crazy stuff on like third and three where they rolled out the quarterback and they could have just threw it over the middle and just kept the ball, you know, kept the chains going. There was a couple of times where Thomas was open in the middle of the field on third and three, and they roll out the quarterback. And, and they, look, they got four DBs out of the game with injuries. I was uh, very surprised that the Saints did not try to attack downfield even more, especially when, when a lot of the defensive backs like Darius Slay and guys like that were going down. Uh, and you know what happened? I mean, they, they hit the downfield throw to uh, Sanders, Emmanuel Sanders, and they got success. And then also after that, after they got the fumble, when Jalen Hurts fumbled, they went down, they threw the ball downfield, and they got right inside the five on like three plates. So, very, very surprised they didn't try to attack that a little bit more, especially when they were trying to drive to make it within one possession. They took four minutes off the clock. So, it was very off game. It, it didn't look crisp. Uh, it looked like the guys weren't really that prepared. Uh, and – there was just a lot of missed opportunities, and it seemed like the Saints didn't want to really be there, to be honest with you. Uh, I think they were looking ahead to Kansas City the next week, too. But there was, just, there was zero room for error, especially how big that buy is with the first seed and home field advantage. And knowing that your, your 41-year-old Hall of Fame quarterback who's injured is coming back in a couple of weeks, and having that buy would be, would be good for them. So, zero room for error, but uh, it was a disappointing game for the Saints. But despite all that, they were right there with an onside kick and almost and and they missed a couple of field goals. It was an off game for uh, what as well, and a lot of missed opportunities. And, and the Eagles played their best game, but the Saints still was right there. They 
should have still won the game. Yeah. I, and here's what I wanted to mention to the to our listeners. Duke Riley, a linebacker for the Eagles that started with Atlanta early in his career. Duke Riley went to John Curtis High School. Duke was a guy that at LSU fans gave up on Duke. You know, he was a guy that didn't play to his red shirt junior year. And people were like, oh, and then he had a great junior year and senior year at LSU. Duke Riley had the game of his life. And here's a guy yeah. from New Orleans who had the onside kick recovery, had an interception, <laughs> and had in double digits and tackles, had the, the best game of his four-year career in the NFL out of all people. A New Orleans native, Duke Riley. You know he had to be happy against the Saints. Yeah, and of course it was an LSU, former LSU player too, which makes it even better because we know a lot of Saints fans are complaining about why they don't draft a lot of right. LSU players. Right. So that that's uh, adds salt to the wound for uh, for Saints fans. Well, I mean, the Saints don't need help at linebacker picking up Quan Alexander, but you know the thing is, like you said, Jace, they didn't look ready. They look like LSU against Missouri. Mm -hmm. Right. They look like right. a team that just wasn't – they were in a funk and nothing went right. And uh, they, they need to tighten up. You know, I mean, they don't want to play Green Bay in the snow in that tundra. They don't – and it's not – they can't win right. those games. You, you know, I don't see Drew Brees coming back. And if they get to that stage and they got to play Green Bay in, in Green Bay and it's snowing, it's not going to happen. Right, and that's why I said there was uh, no room for error, especially when it's up at the number one seed. And Green Bay, they have a pretty wide-open shot just to win the rest of their games and contain that number one seed. So that's why you had the – there was really no room for error for him to, to fall to a game. If there was, it would have been next week against Kansas City, and that would have been understandable. But this was a big loss, and who knows? Like, they still need to clinch the division as well, so – uh, it could be, uh, I mean, they clinch a playoff spot, but uh, home field advantage to the first two games, that's still not guaranteed, especially if Tampa Bay wins out and New Orleans wins out. Yeah, it, it's, it was a lost opportunity, you know, kind of like LSU losing to Mississippi State to start the season and, and then losing at Missouri, and then the season was kind of lost after that. And, and the Saints, but the Saints have an opportunity to still do great things. They've got to. You know, but but on the other hand, they did win some games without Drew. And yeah. Deep, and deep down, I think Coach Payton's happy that, you know, what have they won eight eight straight prior to this loss? They had eight wins. Yeah, I think they won. I think they won nine, nine straight, straight. I believe. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to do. Um. And but you know, when you're Green Bay and you play Detroit twice and the Chicago Bears twice, I mean, that's an easier route. You know, they don't have the conference like you do with the Saints, with Tampa Bay and the Carolinas and the Atlantas. Even though Atlanta's right. got a bad record, Atlanta's way better than Detroit and, and Chicago. Yeah. We're going to go take right. a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about recruiting Wednesday because I'm going to do a show uh, that recaps recruiting that will be aired on Friday of this week on how everything went for Louisiana schools, LSU. We're going to talk a final analysis of LSU. Me and Jace will wrap up the show. We'll be right back. Looking for a used car? Harvey Autos has three dealerships, which means three times the used vehicles. They've got everything from fuel-efficient compacts to luxury models, even hybrids, and certified pre-owned with a warranty. Check out John Harvey Toyota, Harvey Subaru, or Lexus of Shreveport, Bossier City. Welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Scouting Report I'm Lieber Keen, your host. Our guest today is our editor for Louisiana Football Magazine. He does a great job for us, Jace Lejeune, who works with us with Louisiana Football Magazine and LAFootballMagazine.com, our website. If you want to order magazines, you can still get your copies. Um, this segment, we're not going to spend a lot of time, but, Jace, I want to preview that I'm going to, you know, once Wednesday's over, people will hear this show on Wednesday, but once Wednesday's over, I'll have a show on Friday Mm -hmm. going over recruiting and, and touching base on how basically LSU did. A lot of your schools like Tulane and Louisiana Tech and ULM with, with how to coach and ULL, they're not going to sign as many as an SEC school would. They're going to sign most of their guys, I expect, second signing day. 
you, yeah. you might see ULL sign the second most behind LSU because they're having a phenomenal season. But I, right. I, I expect Tulane and Louisiana Tech and, and ULM and the Southland Conference schools, I really feel sorry for these guys because they're practicing – and they haven't had anybody visit their games, no no, no official visits, nothing. So I expect yeah. – and I want parents that hear this. Don't panic because everybody's in the same boat in the United States. Everybody's going to be signing most of their class February 3rd. And I predict that the 1AA schools will still be signing players all through the summer because of lack of ability to get kids on campus – and we still have a dead period. And then the, mm-hmm. and then, and then, the D, then the D1 schools will still be signing players. LSU will still be holding on to two scholarships to sign players after of course. February yeah. 3rd. That's kind of the trend now. Teams are holding two scholarships, the big guys, for graduate transfers and late junior college graduates. Mm-hmm. Because of the loss yep. of their roster. I mean, so many people opting out, so many changes. Jace, there needs to, and I've been I was promoting this seven months ago. The NCA needs to look into allowing these colleges to to manage their roster however they want to, as long as it's eighty five players. Meaning, don't hold them to twenty five only. Don't hold them to you have to sign on one signing day. Meaning, if you're coming from Yale and you're a graduate and you're an all American lineman and you just want to sign in the spring, and it's not even a signing day, let it just count. As yeah. Long as, as long as you're at 85 scholarships, let, give more wiggle room because college coaches are losing players more than ever before with opting out. I mean, it's getting to where they don't have enough. Look, look at LSU. Mm-hmm. Look at Penn right. State. We'll look at Michigan. Yeah. Michigan's down to like 65 players. And that's how it affects on their seasons, too. Just look at, I mean, it's been a down year for Penn State start 0-5 with all the opt-outs. And Michigan, of course, they're having a rough year. LSU had a, start, had a rough year. So, I mean, it, it makes a difference. And I think, too, that if, if, if kids opt out and there's too many, I think the NCAA needs to look at it case by case and say, you know, Y'all are, you know, this school's like 20 under. Even if you sign 25, you're still going to be 20 under 85. We're going to give you five more signees because you're way under. Yeah, right, We're right. going to let you sign 30 because you you, you just lost too much, and it, it's not your fault. Because yeah, something, especially this COVID year. Something's got to be done to manage us better. The NCAA needs to bring something to the table to manage this better. In January is when they have their coaches convention. It's probably going to be on the internet this year. But before the second signing date, they need to come up with something better. And I think the second right. signing date, Jay, should be pushed back to April mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or May. What do you think? Because these kids need time I to agree. visit. Especially a lot of 1AA schools, D2 and D3, need kids on campus. Right. You just don't get that opportunity to visit campuses and talk with the coaches. I mean, there's there's Zoom calls, but you can't really experience the whole experience when you're on campus, when you're meeting with a coach one on one in person, when you know they're talking to the parents. Like all of that, you can't experience the whole experience, and that's why, like, visit you know college campuses on game day. Like you can't have the whole experience, and that might be increasing in opt outs in the future. Because a lot of these players will be signing based on conversations they've had with coaches on Zoom and mm-hmm. on like through online instead of actually getting to meet like meet with the players, talk with the team, and you know vi- like visit a college game. You know, like all around the country, there's been empty stadiums, uh, so they don't get to have that experience. There's no official visits, so there might be even a more increase in opt-outs in the next couple of years because a lot of these recruits are not 100% sure w- like what they're getting themselves into yeah. when going to a college campus. Yeah, because you just graduated from college, and, and you would have probably never went to Southeastern if you couldn't at least go down there and look at it one day, right? Right, exactly. And, yeah, I mean, how many kids that sign Wednesday, meaning sign their letter intent Wednesday, are actually going to like it, like you said, when good point, that when they finally visit and go, man, I'm finally going to that city. 
Yeah. And they go, I don't like it. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's a whole new world. And, and another thing is, if the NCA does make new rules, they might make rules to protect the school. And and I would be okay mm-hmm. with that. Meaning, if you want to opt out, you might lose your scholarship now because they got to get that scholarship back to help their numbers. So there might be a cost to opt out if you're a, if you're a player. Meaning your your scholarship money's gone. Right, and they might have like a game limit. Like okay, like after this many games, you can't opt out. Like right. and so, that's that's another yeah. thing. Like during, yeah, they have to do something like once you're past five games, that. You cannot opt out. They, like the NCAA, you know they're going to have to look at that and try to fix that because I know that's one of the biggest problems throughout the, the country in, in college football is the opt-out problem. Or, or they won't pay for it, obviously, right? So, if, you know, I mean, yeah, it, it works. It's got to, Something's got to be put in place to make people go, well, I might not want to opt out now. i got to fulfill this scholarship. Yeah, right. And, and, again, look, coaches leave all the time, but, I hope young kids listen to this show or others like this. I hope other people are doing it. But the team is the team. It ain't me. It's we. And mm-hmm. we, they try to win. And if you back out of your team, then you're hurting your teammates. Your teammates are now trying to win games without you. I mean, they're trying. They need everybody, every deck on hand. And this Florida game with LSU, well, well, well it really resonates to a lot of people, and it says, you know what? They were to the bare minimum, and these kids played their hearts out mm-hmm. and beat a team they had no business beating. And, and, and this goes to show you, if, if LSU would have had all of their opt-outs, I still think you're looking at a one-loss team to Alabama, maybe. Mm-hmm. You know? I don't think Auburn would have been a blown out, a blowout. I really don't. Not if yeah. Elvin and all these guys would maybe, have played. Maybe worst case scenario, two offs. You know, yeah. maybe they lose to either A&M or, or Auburn or something like that. And that's an acceptable year, of course, around Baton Rouge, especially when you're coming off a national championship. I think they beat A&M if they had Shelvin and Vincent and Marshall and Chase. I really do. Because that would have helped mm-hmm. their quarterbacks. Yeah. I think Chase, and I mentioned it on our podcast over the summer, if Chase was to play – then he would have been there for Brennan. They would have had even a bigger offense against State. State wouldn't have got the ball as much. All those third down, they would have converted those third downs with Chase. Yeah, and then a healthy Derek Stingley wouldn't play Mississippi State game either. And, and Shelvin, I mean, it was, Shelvin would have been great for defense against Missouri. Missouri wouldn't have ran down LSU's throat if they had Kerry Vincent helping too. So Yeah, right. So anyway, I mean, kids, think about this before. I mean, this is something that this is a lesson learned. And, and you know, if, if, if somebody wants to go to the NFL, that's fine. But think about your teammates, you know, not necessarily your coaches, but your teammates. They're out there sweating and, and practicing, trying to win. And people are talking about how they're not any good. And this team's not any good. And, you know, you can't do this. You can't. And then this is what happens. I think this is the light at the end of the tunnel sometimes in sports. And, and look. My final analysis today, Ed Argeron, he needs to reshuffle the deck on the staff, get his staff like it was in 19. Two, he needs to manage his roster better moving forward, keep all his guys together, get rid of the NFL theme. Let's talk about building a, a, a culture of long-term at LSU, not go to the NFL in one year. Let's stop bragging about the players before the season starts. Let's stop maybe mm-hmm. – you know, go on on radio unless it's your coaching show and just lay low on this. Like, like do the old mm-hmm. school approach like Saban does. Like, right. you know, Saban never brags on his players mm-hmm. until it's over. Right, right. There's a reason for that because he doesn't want his team to get the big head and, not, and think they, didn't, they don't have to show up and work. And Right, because I believe, uh, like you just mentioned, a uh, good point because, you know, Devontae Smith, you know, he hadn't really made much about him until just about now. Uh, in the last press conference. So, yeah, just, you know, uh, like hype a player when he's had, a, you know, a, 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 just a lot of other work to and, deal with. And if you hype players too much with your fans, then they're going to hold you to it like this year. They're going to hold you to it. Mm-hmm. And so right. you, you don't want to be put in that position if you're the head coach at LSU is just stop hyping. Let's just get rid of the hype train, right? And let's just mm-hmm. go back to, like, bring your lunchbox, Keep the guys together. And also, my final point is for Ed to come back to Louisiana and recruit Louisiana, make Louisiana number one, 
Mm -hmm. You got to go sign 10 players out of state, get 10, but don't do more than 10. Get 15 in state every year. There's always 15. Jace, mm -hmm. Jace me, yep. you've learned working with me. There's at least 30 every year that LSU can pick from to get 15. And um, yeah, definitely. And, and you know, 10 is plenty out of state. You can find 10 great players. If you want to go get a Ricks, you want to get a Burrow, you want to get a Cole Tracy, you want to get a Patrick Peterson, that's fine. But get back to your state where these kids were going to, they're going to stay here. Especially if there's a COVID or something, they're going to stay in Louisiana. They're going to stick with the team more than like, because they love LSU a little more. They're from here. And no, it's more to have like when looking at the LSU Alabama game, just watch the Alabama game. If that point is well taken with, you know, the players that have stood out for them, uh, you look at their starting linebackers, all three of them are just from Baton Rouge alone. And then you have Devontae Smith from Amy, and you just go on and on. I mean, there's definitely at least 15 players you can bring in, especially at the skill position in state, to get those guys. And you have to go out of state, maybe get a big offensive lineman or so. Then, yeah, I think that would, I mean, that's the best case scenario for LSU. Well, if, if, if Ed can do that, from here on out, I think he could be here a long time. But he's got to he's got to change that that mindset, that culture of NFL. It's got to be back to LSU school slash football and team, mm -hmm. and team, right. and team. Yeah, team team ball, not not like individual ball and, and bragging. And you know, it the fans are going to hold you to it in Baton Rouge. If you say we're going to be the greatest defense we've had in ten years, you got to back it up. Mm -hmm. And if he would have yep. ever said that then I don't think the pressure would have been as bad. If you would have said, we're not going to be as good this year, uh -huh. then they would. the fans wouldn't have been, I think, I, from talking to a lot of people I know, they wouldn't be upset. Yeah. You can't yeah, be truthful. Yeah. Be up front. Yeah, but, uh, Jace, thanks for joining us. We went two hours today, man. It's crazy. Yeah, it is pretty crazy. And one more thing, one more person we got, or actually not person, but thing we got, uh, reach, I mean, Give a shout out to for the LSU game is a, a cold, cold Taylor shoe. You know, I think that, <laughs> yeah, that, that shoe deserves a, a shout out as well. I didn't want to overdo it. I know the shoes get. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I didn't even know Jason. I, I don't. I'm not into politics, but I watched a video, and you probably have too. But they used the old video. I didn't even know somebody threw a shoe at President Bush way back in a press conference, but. <laughs> but, but supposedly yeah. that happened and I don't know maybe I was on planet Pluto when it happened but <laughs> they, they tied that in with this and yeah uh, I've seen it yeah you know, un <laughs> unfortunately the defensive back from Florida is going to be remembered for that and that's not something you want to be remembered for yeah right I think he might did go another pro. crazy he you for the game I think Marco might go pro now. What do you think? He's already a pro prospect. You think that might say I'm out of here? Yeah. <laughs> He's probably leaving games so after that. <laughs> I'm history. I went to American Heritage High School in Miami. I'm out of here. Um, yeah. So, final right. thoughts. I do not think, and this is going to cause some, some, some disagreement, but I'm old school. I think the SEC was down this year. And I think mm -hmm. it was watered down this year. I thought LSU, this should have been a, a year LSU should have had a great year because it was watered down. And that's why Florida had a good year, and that's why A&M had a good year. I don't think they're great teams, but I think it's a watered down conference. And what I'm getting to is I don't think Mac Jones is the greatest quarterback ever at Alabama, and I don't think he's the, great, the greatest player in the college football. What I do think, I think Mac Jones has done a great job with mm – -hmm. Phenomenal talent and no defenses in the league. Um, but I don't think he's any different of a pro prospect than Greg McElroy or Brody Kroll because nobody can get to him. Nobody even touches him. Yeah. And in the NFL, Jace, Mac is – he can't cool. move. He can't run like Burrow and those guys. So, I don't think he's going to be a pro at all. I don't think he'll have a, a long pro future. I think he's a – He can be a I think serviceable a backup, you know, that kind of career, you know, but he won't be a – I don't think he's going to be a full-time NFL starter. No. I mean, when you got eight seconds to pass and eat a sandwich, <laughs> I can be a Heisman Trophy candidate. If you had Najee Harris and five running backs, you got Devontae Smith, you got all these that, – that offensive line, they don't even touch him. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. When I think that's what's on the right about this Alabama team is nobody really, everybody talks about Najee Harris and Matt Jones and Devontae Smith, but the offensive line, I mean, they have to be by far the best unit in, in college football. And like Matt Jones, like you said, he can sit back there, you know, uh, for like hours back there and make a throw. So, uh, it really gives credit to the offensive line and how good that, that unit made a big difference from this year. I think he's the third best player on the team. I think Devontae Smith's the best player on the team. And then yeah. Najee, Najee Harris is second. And, mm-hmm. and he just throws the ball up and they get it. And I'm not taking anything away from him, but if you give me nine seconds to throw, I'd be pretty good too. Um, and then, But the best player in the country, I think, is Lawrence at Clemson. And I think mm-hmm. the quarterback at Ohio State, I do think – the Heisman hasn't been decided. And yeah. I, do, I do know that Trask is out of it now, that bad game. I, yeah. I, I don't think they beat Alabama. That's the only way he gets back into that. I just don't see that happening. No, I don't. And uh, if you, if I had a vote for it for this year, if you tell, tell me that this year who is the best player in college football, based off uh, not a quarterback, but any position, I would give it to Devontae Smith because he's – to me, I feel like he's been the best player all year long. They need to change the award and say the quarterback award. Yeah, right. Because they're, right. they're not looking at the best player anymore. They, they, it's all quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. Remember, yeah, Charles, To me, he is the best player. The last non-quarterback to win it was, what, Charles Woodson at Michigan. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, they had a couple of running backs here, like Derrick Henry and – a couple guys here and there, I think at running back, but not much. It's been mostly quarterback the last twenty years or so. Yeah, they need to they need to they need to change the way they look at who the winner is. I mean, it's getting to be just a political quarterback. If you're a quarterback, you win the Heisman and the best core uh the quarterback on the best team pretty much. It should be the best player regardless of the team. You know, like Yeah. You know, there's some team there's some guys playing this year at Brigham Young and Cincinnati and some other mm-hmm. schools that, you know, it's the media controlling it. You don't hear about them. If they don't push it, you don't hear about it. But Right, know, right. Uh, you know, even USC's quarterback is one of the yeah. best players in the, in, you know, in the country from, he's from the state of Arizona, by the way. He's a true sophomore, but you don't. Yeah, he's the reason him. why they're undefeated. <laughs> yeah, and you don't even hear about him. They're not even pushing him. The, the, the media don't mm-hmm. even bring his name up. But he, yep. he's 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 a better quarterback than Mac Jones. He doesn't have the talent Mac Jones has around. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. But Jace, don't hang up. We're going to end the show. I hope everybody had a great Wednesday when you hear this show, and then we look forward to hear, uh, talking to you again on Friday. We'll have our recruiting show on Friday, uh, and we look forward to that. And everybody, have a great week. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Sports Scouting Report podcast with Lee Brookings.